and sell the drugs to prevent the long term problems. But we, we're going to be involved in a number of drug trials. So there are some drugs on the way that will function centrally to try and reduce appetite. People are afraid I'm going to put them on a treadmill for the rest of the day. <laughs> and that, that I insist that you stand for the remainder of the presentation. It shouldn't just be the speaker, it should actually be the audience. Hi, Molly Byrne from Main Life Long. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, I'm just interested in terms of your own clinical experience. Uh, uh, you said in terms of struggling with the behavior change strategies. In your own experience, has there been any strategy? Um, I, 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 I think the psychologist is a key element of the weight management team and um, uh, so I rely a lot on the psychologist, the psychologist who's really committed and passionate about it because not all psychologists will be just like not all physicians are interested in it. So I can't give you one that I kind of use personally myself um, other than trying to um, really talk about the decision to do something, you know, to be conscious that there's one way of doing it, another way of doing it. And, and the easy way is sometimes a health detrimental way, and they have to give some thought to this. But, but I think the, the psychologists are, uh, and we, it took us a while to get good psychology support here, but we have that now. And I, I really let that part of it to, to them in a multidisciplinary team. BBC report this morning from the NHS suggesting it would be economically viable to do surgery on about 2 million people. We want the infrastructures in place for that. And sometimes there can be a moralistic social view on obesity. So is there a consensus for that? Yeah, sure, there's a consensus, but I know Francis is big. Francis Finucane, that is my colleague, he's, he runs the bariatric program in the hospital. He's I'm sure you'll be speaking much more to this, Francis, but you're absolutely right that if you Look at the numbers who are eligible for bariatric surgery on the basis of BMI. So mm -hmm. if your BMI is over 35 and you have comorbidities, then you're eligible. You're med you know, nice in the UK, would say they should be considered for bariatric surgery. Um, and that's a, I don't have the actual numbers, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very, and we couldn't cope with that number in, in our system. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks. very active down at the back is Damon Cochran because uh, he, he's not only walking, he's carrying chairs. So if you were, if you are down at the back and uh, there are some spare chairs, seats up here and then save, deal with some energy expenditure. Um, anyway, my, uh, or my next task now is to introduce uh, our keynote speaker of the day, uh, John Cawley. Uh, John is the professor of, uh, a professor in the Department of Policy Analysis and Management and uh, the Department of Economics at Cornell University. Uh, John got his PhD from the University of Chicago and then did a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And he's been at Cornell for, I think, about 11 years. And uh, when, when, um, when John agreed to, to pay us a visit uh, in October, uh, we were especially delighted because we knew of his work, uh, much of it is on the economics of obesity, and we thought, uh, it would be really great for him to, to speak to a, 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 such a large audience as we've gathered here. So um, I'll let you get going. So thanks very much for having me. I'm really honored. And uh, I really particularly want to thank uh, Kieran O'Neill for inviting me uh, for, to Brendan Kennelly for uh, organizing this great conference. And uh, along the lines of what uh, uh, Dr. Curtin was saying at the beginning, I think uh, you've built an amazing group of health economists here. Uh, the health economics and policy analysis group is just absolutely world class in terms of the quantity and quality of health economists. So uh, it's been an exciting visit. Great to talk to uh, the faculty, the postdocs, and the, and the graduate students, and uh, really impressed by the work you're doing. So what I wanted to do is, is cover uh, the economic perspective on obesity. And I thought one way to do that is to first start by really just motivating 
uh, why is it interesting and important to study obesity? So I think each of us has our own reasons for being interested in the topic, but I think it, it, it is worth taking a few minutes to just think about the long run perspective. So in particular, I wanna mention the epidemiologic transition. So this is a change that's occurred over several centuries in uh, what it is that we're dying from, and increasingly uh, we're dying from obesity. Uh, then I just wanna take a few minutes to describe exactly what I mean by obesity, talk about the standard definitions, uh, how obesity is measured, and then the shortcomings in the traditional definition and measurement. And then provide a little more background, uh, supplement uh, what Dr. O'Brien was presenting and pr provide a little bit more information about the prevalence and trends in obesity worldwide. And then I'll move to sort of the meat of the, uh, of the uh, talk and talk about the economics of obesity. So I'm an economist and uh, thus economics is the lens through which I view diet, physical activity, and obesity. So I'll first start off by telling you the basic intuition of how economists think about uh, those activities and how we differ from other social scientists. Uh, then I'll just describe briefly what research indicates are some of the economic contributors to obesity, what are some of the economic consequences of obesity, and then finally how we can use economics to uh, help prevent and treat obesity. And then finally I'll sort of summarize, uh, summarize this all on a set of takeaway points. So in terms of the big picture, uh, why we should care about obesity, it's really part of a trend that's been occurring, like I said, over several centuries, which is called the epidemiologic transition. So this describes uh, the transition from living in a world in the 1700s, 1800s, even 1900, uh, living in a world in which people predominantly died of infectious disease to a world today where people predominantly die from their own choices. They die from their own risky health behaviors. So one way to see this is to just look at the top causes of death in 1900 versus more recently. So in the table on this slide, you can see in 1900, for the United States, the top three causes of death were, uh, number one, pneumonia and influenza, collectively, number two, tuberculosis, and number three, diarrhea. So all the results of infectious disease. Uh, and what's been really miraculous in, in, in many ways is that the progress through medicine, through public health, has changed the world so dramatically that it's almost unrecognizable. So the number two cause of death back in 1900, tuberculosis, uh, it's so invisible today, it's so reduced, that people don't even know what tuberculosis is, right? It's not recognizable. So to, to understand what that means, it's as if 100 years from now, people didn't know what cancer meant, right? That's how dramatic the change has been. So while in 1900 we predominantly died of these epidemics of infectious disease, in 2009, the most recent uh, year I have these data available, the top three causes of death were heart disease, uh, cancer, and then lower respiratory disease. And so these are predominantly caused by smoking, by poor diet, sedentary lifestyles. And so again, one reason that we need to care ob about obesity is because predominantly now we are dying from our own risky health behaviors. So we need to better understand why people engage in these risky behaviors and what their consequences are. Just another way of illustrating this epidemiologic transition comes from some work that was done by the Centers for Disease Control. So what they did is they took all the death certificates for a single year in the United States and categorized all the causes of death. But then they went further and they went back and said, well, what do we know about the population attributable risks? What are the things that are leading to these diseases that are killing people? And this they categorized as the actual causes of death. And so you can see they did this twice for 1990 and 2000. So just focusing on the column for 2000, what they concluded the actual causes of death were, so like I said before, it's really predominantly heart disease, cancer, respiratory disease, but the things that are contributing to those ultimate causes of death are number one, smoking, which killed 435,000 people, 18% of all deaths in the year 2000, but the number two preventable cause of death was poor diet and physical inactivity, so basically the contributors to obesity. That killed 365,000 people back in the year 2000, representing 15% of all deaths. Number three is alcohol consumption. Also on the list is uh, unprotected sexual activity, uh, illegal drug use, and so on. And so again, it's just a really nice illustration of the fact that today, in this day and age, thanks to the progress of medicine and public health, we die because of our own risky health behaviors. So now let me uh, just briefly describe what obesity is, what we mean by this term, how it's defined and how it's measured, and the shortcomings of those, uh, those definitions and those measurements. So obesity, the most common uh, measurement or, or, or um, yeah, measure of fatness and obesity in epidemiology and medicine is the body mass index. So your BMI or body mass index is just your weight for your height. It's calculated as your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So we take that continuous index 
and there's sort of relatively arbitrary cut points imposed on that used to classify people into certain categories. So for example, a person is considered to be overweight if their BMI is greater than or equal to 25. So to help make that more salient or uh, understandable, what that means is uh, a six foot tall, tall person would be considered overweight if they weigh at least 184 pounds. And it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman, they have the same cut points for both. Obesity is defined as a body mass index of greater than or equal to 30. Uh, so for a six foot tall person, that's equivalent to 221 pounds. So those are the categorizations for adults. Uh, the classifications for children, there's more ambiguity, there's less uh, uniform agreement on that. One standard is to just use a historic distribution of child weight for height and just arbitrarily say any child today that's over the historic 85th percentile will consider overweight. Any child today who's over the historic 95th percentile will consider to be obese. However, other countries, other groups uh, classify children as overweight or obese using different weight for height charts. Now, one thing that's uh, really important to point out is that when you're calculating BMI, it's much preferred to use measurements of weight and height than to use a person's self-reported weight and height. And I, po I point this out because a lot of the time, the data sets that we have access to uh, include only self-reported weight and height, and so it's very frequently used in, in research. But the problem is, is that, not surprisingly, people tend to be tend to underreport their weight. So there's a phenomenon in, in survey research of social desirability bias that the respondent wants to tell the interviewer an answer that they think the interviewer wants to hear or that they think is socially acceptable. And so people tend to underreport their weights, and this can lead to severe misclassification bias. So for example, in the US, we have a a national health and nutrition examination survey where people are both asked their weight and height and then they're subsequently measured. And so that actually allows you to measure quite accurately the extent of underreporting uh, in weight and height. And what we find, uh, my, ca my colleague Catherine McLean and I, is that from, for the data from 2003 to 2010, 14.8% uh, of the people who truly are obese would not seem to be obese if you use their self-reported weight and height to calculate their BMI. So you'd be missing one in six or one in seven people who are truly obese if you rely on self-reports. And David Madden and others uh, here have used uh, the SLAM, which I guess has both self-reported weight and height and measurements to look at the, the uh, under-reporting of weight uh, here in Ireland as well. So a problem uh, with using BMI, though, uh, as a measure of fatness is that it doesn't measure fat, right? It's just your weight for your height. Uh, it ignores body composition. A kilogram of, of body mass is treated equally whether that body mass is fat or whether it's muscle. Um, and so as a result, uh, BMI is, I think, in, in some cases, a very misleading uh, measure of fatness. So one thing that uh, Rich Burkhauser and I have found uh, in the NHANES data is that the use of BMI can lead to exaggerated uh, impressions of who is truly obese. So for example, if you use BMI instead of something that's more accurate like percent body fat, then the black-white gap in obesity among women in the US is twice what it is when you use percent body fat because there's racial differences in uh, lean muscle mass for a given level of BMI. Also, uh, many uh, medical researchers have found that BMI predicts obesity-related morbidities less accurately than other measures of fatness. So heart attacks might be less easily predicted using BMI than using other measures. So there exist a variety of other alternatives, like for example, using just percent body fat to, to tr uh, classify people as obese. So you could, uh, for example, use the threshold of 25% uh, body fat to classify a man as obese or 30% for women. That's the standard of the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health in the US. And you can measure percent body fat using uh, skin fold thickness, using calipers. Uh, more high tech uh, devices include bioelectrical impedance analysis which runs a small, uh, uh, weak electrical current through your body on the principle that lean mass, like muscle and blood, conducts electricity and fat is an insulator. And so you can stand on these uh, metal plates, they, they sort of have these devices at conferences, and grip other metal uh, handles and it'll run this electricity painlessly through your body. And then you can get a printout that not only tells you your percent body fat, but it'll tell you limb by limb uh, how much kilos of fat you have, and oddly, I'm not symmetric. You know, like one arm and one leg have more than another, and I, I don't know why. Maybe there's something to do with right-handedness, but. Uh, another alternative is to use dual X-ray absorptiometry, which uses two different sort of wavelengths of X-rays to measure lean mass, and then uh, by omission, what's left over is, is fat mass. So there exist a lot of ways that we can more accurately measure fatness, but frankly, for the sake of convenience, we tend to use BMI more. And so given that weight and height tend to be in the data sets we use and not percent body fat, 
Obviously, we have to proceed with what's available, but I think it's important to keep in mind the limitations of the data that we're using. So to ext extend on uh, Dr. O'Brien's um, uh, discussion earlier of, of changes in obesity, uh, this is some data from uh, various developed countries. Uh, it was published in The Lancet in 2011. And what it shows you is that, in general, obesity has been rising in economically developed countries of the world. Uh, so this list includes the USA, England, Spain, Austria, Australia, France, Korea, Canada, and Italy. Now the last few data points uh, obviously are projections because this graph goes out to 2020 and we don't know what uh, obesity is going to be yet at that point. They're projections based on trends in each country. But from the middle part of the graph, you can see that obesity has clearly been rising uh, across the world. Now the United States it is at the top, uh, currently more than two-thirds of all Americans are clinically overweight. This, this graph is actually showing you overweight. Uh, the same thing is true for children. This graph is showing you, from, from the same article in The Lancet, showing you the rise in childhood overweight in various countries of the world. So, uh, you know, largely parallel increases in overweight and obesity. So there has been this historically remarkable rise in the prevalence of obesity, overweight, in mean body weight across many different countries of the world. So uh, the World Health Organization has estimated that as of the year 2008, roughly 1.4 billion adults, more than one-third of all adults worldwide, were overweight, and roughly 500 million adults, about 12% of those worldwide, were obese. And not surprisingly, the prevalence does in fact vary by country. So I want to uh, direct your attention to the uh, left-hand side of this graph. Uh, and the graph makes a really important distinction, which is some countries measure uh, obesity using self-reports, and others measure it using measurements of weight and height. And as I mentioned before, this tendency to underreport means that it's hard to compare across countries that use those two methods. There's other important differences in the way that countries uh, measure obesity. Some use nationally representative samples and others sort of convenient samples just from urban areas. So it is, it is difficult to compare across countries. Uh, keep that in mind. Are indicated in the darker, sort of blue or purple and the countries whose uh, prevalence of obesity is based on measurements appear in the lighter, almost grayish color. And so not surprisingly, the countries that are all at the bottom of this graph that have the highest prevalence of obesity uh, are those that are measuring weight and height. And presumably, if some of those countries in the middle of this graph had instead measured weights and heights instead of collected self-reports, they, they would be showing up much lower down. So uh, what's interesting is that Ireland and the countries that I think Ireland frequently compares it to, the the destinations of the Irish diaspora uh, are all towards the bottom of this graph. So the country on this graph with the highest prevalence of obesity is the United States at 36.5%. So again, more than one in three adult Americans is clinically obese, and that's based on measurements. Uh, just above the US, uh, slightly lower prevalence of obesity is Mexico, and then in descending uh, prevalence is New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Chile, United Kingdom, Luxembourg, and Ireland. What is uh, shown on the right-hand side of the graph are the prevalence of obesity for women and men. And so the women are shown in the darker purple, men in the sort of more gray. And there's slight differences in the prevalence of obesity between women and men. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, a perfectly consistent pattern, but in general, the prevalence of obesity tends to be slightly higher among women than among men. So the previous data here come from the OECD. Uh, this data come from the World Health Organization. It's for, from 2008 instead of 2011. Uh, and it's just another way of showing you some similar data. So the prevalence of obesity is the highest category of obesity is indicated with red. That's a prevalence of 30 or higher. So the U.S. and Mexico, Venezuela, South Africa, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and, and Syria all have really high prevalences of obesity. But actually, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, the U.S. doesn't have the single highest prevalence of obesity in the entire world. Uh, the single highest prevalences are found in the Pacific. So they're small island countries like Samoa, Tonga, Nauru, uh, they'll have prevalence of obesity of 65%, 75% or higher among adults compared to the 36% for the U.S. So before I go on and talk about uh, the economic perspective on the causes, consequences, and hopefully solutions to the problem of obesity, I just wanted to clarify my, um, uh, my perspective about the importance of economics in this effort. So my perspective to clarify is not that economics is the only discipline that's important. It's not even necessarily that economics is the most important perspective. My uh, argument is really just that economics is one valuable perspective that can be fruitfully used to study the problem of obesity. And so uh, just, to, just to, to indicate that that's not just cheap talk, 
uh, I just wanted to mention uh, the Oxford Handbook of the Social Science of Obesity, which I edited in 2011. So when I first started studying obesity, I really wanted to know how other social science disciplines uh, study diet, physical activity, and obesity. And so I went looking for succinct, you know, accessible descriptions of how different disciplines study this question. And I found that for many disciplines, they simply weren't available. Right? People within any given discipline talked mainly to each other, and it was at generally a higher level, not very introductory. So the purpose of uh, editing this book was to really try and create like a sort of Rosetta Stone that um, provided accessible introductions to the study of obesity from every relevant disciplinary perspective. So part one of this book contains those kinds of uh, discussions from the perspective of epidemiology, demography, cleometrics, which is of a historical, uh, which, which is uh, history, but in a very statistical quantitative uh, perspective. Anthropology, psychology, sociology, economics, government or politics, as well as more uh, sort of postmodern fields like fat studies. So, uh, like I said, that's just to emphasize that I think many, many disciplines have important perspectives on this problem. Obesity is inherently a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary problem, and I think we have the greatest chance of breakthroughs when we all talk to each other and we all work together. Um, and so I'm not claiming sort of economic imperialism here, but just want to help you understand what I think economics can contribute to the study of this important problem. So what does economics really have to contribute? Uh, economics, I think, has relatively recently come to the study of obesity, whereas other fields have been studying it for decades. So one contribution that I think economics can make is that it, it really offers a, a widely accepted theoretical framework for human behavior. So I think frequently people outside the discipline of economics think of economics from what they hear on the news or what they see in the business page. And they think economics, eh, it's about like interest rates and exchange rates and trade deficits, all that boring stuff that aggregate, these aggregate numbers that don't really seem to have much impact on my life. But economics is a social science. It's the study of human behavior, why people do the things that they do. And economists have a relatively unique view of human behavior, which is that we use a framework that we call constrained maximization. So in brief, the assumption is that people are trying to make themselves as well off as possible. You could call that happiness, or you could call it utility, subject to the constraints that they face, constraints like time, constraints like money. So as a result of having this you know, relatively unique or distinct view of how people make decisions, economists tend to ask different questions as concerns obesity. An anthropologist would think about diet and physical activity in a very different way than an economist. Uh, economists sort of generate different predictions. And in particular, we tend to focus on things like prices, uh, income, and then the trade-offs that are associated with different decisions. Another advantage of economics is that it offers really clearly defined rationales for when the government should intervene in markets. So one thing that, I've, uh, that I think is remarkable about the discussions of obesity-related policies is that there's frequently a lot of uncertainty about when uh, the government should intervene and how. And there's concern that people are just being paternalistic, that there's a desire to sort of uh, shame people who are obese or uh, sort of a nanny state that just wants to tell people how to live their lives. And the nice thing about economics is that it offers some really clearly defined rationales for when it makes sense for the government to intervene. We don't have to think it through on a case-by-case -case basis. We can use these uh, rationales, which I'll expand on uh, in just a little bit. But the basic philosophy is to fix market failures, to look for problems in the marketplace and fix those uh, market failures. That's the sort of rationale, and I'll, I'll expand on that in just a bit. And then finally, I think the other advantage that economics brings is relates to the methods used by economics. So econometrics is the term for the quantitative methods that economists use. And something that makes economics somewhat different than sociology and epidemiology and other, and other disciplines is that there's a real premium put on measuring causal effects. So not just measuring correlations between two variables, but finding ways to measure what's the effect of one variable on another. And so obviously one uh, ideal way to do that is with a randomized controlled trial. But especially in obesity, there's lots of times when it would be unethical or impossible to run a randomized controlled trial, right? We can't force people to become overweight so we can see what it does to their heart attack risk and to their health care costs. And so economists um, uh, have for a generation or two been really focused on trying to exploit natural experiments for looking for variation in key, vari uh, key variables that uh, can be exploited that in a way that's akin to uh, a randomized control trial that's designed by the, uh, by the investigator. These methods are really useful for measuring what's, what are the true causes and consequences of obesity, and then also which interventions are likely to work. And then finally, uh, the toolkit of cost-effectiveness analysis is really useful for figuring out which of many different alternatives 
gives us the biggest bang for the buck, which, which gives us the biggest societal return for a fixed budget that we have to spend on obesity prevention. So I'll expand on, on each of these points. So let me start off by just giving you a sense of how economists think. This might seem like a scary proposition, but just tell you the basic sort of intuition of an economic model of diet and physical activity. So as I said before, economists tend to think of every human behavior in terms of constraint maximization, people trying to make themselves as well off as possible given the constraints that they face. So taking that basic template and applying it to obesity means that individuals are choosing their diet, so quantity and quality. So how much do I want to eat in terms of calories, and what is the quality of the food that I'm eating in terms of nutrients and uh, amounts of fat and so on. So they're choosing their diets, and they're also choosing ways of spending their time. So in other words, they're choosing their level of physical activity in order to maximize their happiness, in order to maximize their utility. And people aren't directly choosing their weight, of course. They're choosing their diet and their physical activity, and then the weight is the result of all those choices. The choice is not just today, but in the past. And so our weight basically represents the sum of past caloric surpluses, the extra amount we consumed, the number of calories we consumed, you know, relative to what we burned. So if obviously that we had all the time in the world, all the money in the world, then we could eat whatever we wanted, we could uh, you know, exercise as much as we like and still be our ideal weight, but the problem is, is that money and time are scarce. We face these constraints on our money, constraints on our time, and so in order to make themselves as well off as possible, people have to consider the costs and benefits of different strategies. Uh, they have to consider you know, what is the cost of going and buying fresh fruits and vegetables twice a week? What are the implications for my time if I want to prepare every meal from scratch at home to ensure that it's as healthy as possible? And in weighing these costs and benefits, implicitly people are thinking about the trade-offs associated with each different possible way of living their life. So that's really uh, all the background I think you need to understand how economists uh, think about diet, physical activity, and, and therefore obesity. And that simple model of constraint maximization has some really important insights. So one of them uh, is that individuals may rationally accept to be heavier in exchange for other things that they value. And I think this is a really important basic point to make because I think that sometimes it's a real puritanism, uh, puritanical view of obesity, a real judgment uh, or, or shaming that goes on with individuals who are overweight and obese. But the fact that somebody's clinically overweight or clinically obese isn't proof that they're irrational or mentally ill or making bad decisions. All that it means is they found it um, you know, a better situation for themselves to pursue a diet and physical activity pattern that led to this than to pursue the alternatives. And so if you want to understand obesity, then we need to understand why some people find it optimal to take in a diet and engage in physical activity patterns that lead to overweight and obesity. So, and what I mean by that is we need to understand are, is a given individual obese because, for example, they have a low income and they can't afford to buy fresh fruits and vegetables twice a week? Is it maybe not the income side, but maybe it's just the high prices that they personally face for fresh fruits and vegetables? Or is it not really about money at all? Maybe it's about time costs. Maybe the person lives in a place that doesn't have a full service grocery store and they don't have access to a car, and so they have to take tra public transportation for an hour, buy fresh fruits and vegetables, carry it back, and it's just a really high time cost to eating healthy. Um, another possibility is that it's, uh, the problem relates to a high opportunity cost of their time. In other words, they have a lot of other demands on their time. So it could be that people, for example, with young children, find it uh, uh, ideal or sort of optimal for them to spend more time with their young children and less time at the gym, right? Uh, or less time preparing meals from scratch. And then finally, one possibility is that some people simply have a high marginal utility of consuming uh, high calorie foods or are really averse to exercise, that it's really painful or unpleasant for them to exercise. They really enjoy eating what are called energy dense foods, foods that have a high uh, sort of number of calories per unit weight. Uh, so in other words, we need to not uh, judge people who are obese, but better understand why did they make the decisions that led them to this place. Another implication of the economic model is that when the costs and benefits of various diets and physical, various physical activity patterns change, that people will alter their choices. And so this suggests possible explanations for the rise in obesity. So maybe the rise in obesity that we've seen in these graphs is partly due to, for example, uh, energy dense or high calorie foods becoming cheaper relative to fresh fruits and vegetables. Maybe it's related to the fact that being sedentary has become more enjoyable. Right? So when I was a kid, there were just four channels on the television. Now there's well over 100. 
Right now, you can use Netflix to stream instantly thousands of movies to your television. So it's become much more rewarding, much more enjoyable to be sedentary. And the economic model suggests when something becomes more enjoyable, people will consume more of it. Um, another possibility is that employment has become more sedentary. Right? So if you, if you look back, you do your family tree, and you look at the occupations that your ancestors had, they probably had occupations like farmer, blacksmith, uh, these other physically demanding jobs that there's very few of nowadays. And even sedentary jobs have become more sedentary over time. So I have to credit uh, Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford for this example, but it's so uh, relevant to my own life that I have to use it. Um, so he, makes the, he gives the example of how, um, you know, when we were grad students, you had to walk to the library. We went to the library every single day, and you'd go to the stacks, and you'd take out the bound copies of the journals, and you would physically open the, you know, the, the book of the, uh, journal art, the journals to photocopy them. Then you'd walk back to your office with them, and every day you'd repeat this, right? So there's a lot of walking, there's a lot of going to the stacks, lifting things. And nowadays, I never go to the library because I can just download PDFs of any article I want right to my computer. So even a sedentary job, like being a researcher, has become more sedentary just in the last 20 years. Um, now, another imp uh, interesting implication that comes out of the economic model is that simply telling people that they should behave differently isn't predicted to have any effect at all, right? So if people are making decisions on the basis of the costs and benefits of various diets, various physical activities, then there's a reason that they're, that they're undertaking these behaviors. And it's simply telling somebody, well, you really should do something else. You really should be more active. You really should you know, eat lower calorie foods and more nutritious foods. That's not going to change the costs and benefits for them. If you want people to change, you need to make it in their interest to change. You need to incentivize uh, healthy eating. You need to incentivize greater physical activity. So uh, now I just want to switch to talking about what we know from economic research about possible uh, explanations, possible economic causes of the rise in obesity. So an obvious one to think about is the falling cost of high calorie foods. Um, so a, a very sort of vivid example is that in the U.S. from 1990 to 2007, the price of a two liter of Coke fell by 34.9 percent when you adjust for inflation. And over that same time, the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables was rising. So in other words, over that 20 years, it became relatively cheaper to consume a high calorie diet than a low calorie, high nutrient diet. And the economic model says when something becomes cheaper, people will do more of it. Uh, Tom, Thomas Phillipson and Darius Lakdawalla have estimated that 40% of the recent rise in weight is due to falling food prices in the U.S. Uh, and then uh, I'm engaged in an uh, experiment with my colleagues at Cornell, Brian Wansink, David Just, and others, where we're analyzing data from uh, an experiment where we were able to manipulate the relative prices of food in a supermarket. So the subjects were all have these loyalty cards so you can track all of their purchases, and a control group just got a, a sort of set 15% discount on all their purchases. And then the treatment group was divided into those who were told that they were getting um, a deal where uh, they were going to get a subsidy of nutritious foods. So in other words, they would get a base discount on everything, but an additional 10% discount on nutritious foods. And another treatment group was told, you're going to get a discount on everything, but you're going to be relatively penalized for bu buying non-nutritious foods. Those are going to get you 10% less of a, of a rebate. And so it's exactly the same thing happening to both of the treatment groups. They're each... Uh, being faced with a situation where nutritious foods are 10% cheaper than they used to be relative to non-nutritious foods, but some of them see it, are told it's a tax on non-nutritious foods, and others are told it's a subsidy of nutritious foods, and we really don't find uh, any difference between either group and the control group. So in other words, manipulating uh, the prices of um, nutritious foods by 10% really didn't generate a meaningful change. So what that suggests to us is that if you want to change people's behavior, it's going to take in a larger price change than that. Right, so maybe something more akin to this 35% decrease in the price of Coke. Another uh, economic uh, factor that's involved is technological change. So David Cutler at Harvard makes this vivid uh, example uh, where he says that it was always possible to eat a cream-filled cake. But in colonial days, you had to go milk the cow, uh, skim off the cream, whip the cream up in a bowl by hand, right, no mixer, uh, bake a cake which took an hour, then scoop out the middle of the cake, put in the cream, bang, you have your cream-filled cake. Uh, nowadays, thanks to technological change, all you have to do is walk to the vending machine and there's a cream-filled cake waiting there for you. So the time cost of eating energy-dense foods has gone way down thanks to these technological advancements. Now another factor that is uh, highly contentious uh, and sort of, I think, you know, honestly emotionally wrenching for some people is that uh, some researchers have found, uh, not just in the U.S., but, but in many countries in Europe as well, that maternal employment is associated with a higher risk of childhood obesity in that family. So controlling for everything else that you know about the family, if the mother works, there's a higher risk that the children are overweight or obese. Uh, 
Um, and so this was uh, sort of seen as a black box. It wasn't clear why this was the case. And so uh, Feng Lu and I looked at time use data for the United States. And what we found is that um, you know, working mothers do spend significantly fewer minutes shopping for groceries, fewer minutes cooking from scratch, fewer minutes eating with their children, and fewer minutes playing with their children. So one mechanism for this may be that when there's a working mother in the household, that the kids are eating a worse diet, they're supervised less of the time. Others have found that kids uh, indulge in more screen time or TV time when the mother's working. But I think it's really important to point out this is not to blame mothers, because in this time use data, we're also able to look at fathers, and fathers offset only about 8% of the decrease in time that's due to the mother working. So if you can blame the fathers, you know, at least as much for not stepping in to cook more of those uh, you know, meals that are going down to spend more of the time supervising children. Another possible economic contributor to obesity would be uh, rising income. So the World Health Organization has argued that uh, maybe one explanation for rising obesity all over the world is just the fact that people have more disposable income, and so they can buy more luxury foods, which tend to be higher, higher calorie. Uh, and so to test this, we took advantage of a natural experiment in the U.S. So in the U.S., there was this legislative mistake where Congress accidentally uh, created a situation where certain birth year cohorts of retirees got extra retirement payments through the Social Security program. And they didn't realize this for several years, and when they realized it, um, they had to just kind of grandfather in the people benefiting from this and end it for future cohorts. So in other words, certain people, for no other reason than being born in a certain birth year, were endowed for the rest of their lives with higher retirement payments than people born just before them or just after them. And it was truly a legislative accident. So this is what economists dream of, this kind of natural experiment. It's like money falling from the sky, but only for certain people and not others, and it's, it's relatively random. And so this is a great way to measure what's the impact of income on obesity, because there's certain groups that are getting extra income, for, not because of how hard they worked or anything else. And we, we find a very precisely estimated zero. So in other words, this additional income, $1,000 a year or more for the rest of your life, has no detectable uh, effect at all on the weight of elderly Americans. So we don't find any evidence in support of this World Health Organization claim that rising income is contributing to obesity. But there is the caveat that we're only able to look at the elderly and only in the US. Another possible explanation is rising advertising, or maybe more effective advertising. And so with some uh, colleagues at Cornell, uh, we've got access to data where we know people's consumption of specific branded food items, and we can calculate their exposure to advertisements for specific branded food items. So for the first time, we'll be able to measure uh, how much does your consumption of Coca-Cola go up based on how many ads for Coca-Cola that you see, and does your consumption of Coke go down when you see Pepsi ads because it's a competitor, or does seeing a Pepsi ad just kind of make you think of carbonated beverages in general and your consumption of Coke may rise? So that's, uh, that's currently in progress. But one thing I want to point out is that um, I'm personally very skeptical that we're ever going to be able to say with any kind of certainty what are the factors that led to the rise in obesity. And the reason is is that uh, changes in weight can be due to very small additional numbers of calories per day. So for example, some, research have, some researchers have calculated that the increase in youth obesity in the U.S. between 1971 and 2008 was due to just an additional 41 calories per day. Um, for an adult, if you increased your um, calorie consumption by just 100 calories per day, that would lead eventually to a gain in weight of 10 pounds. So these very small differences per day can lead to large changes in your weight over time. And in a way, that's kind of bad news for trying to look back and determine what factors caused the rise in obesity, because our data on the number of calories that people consume, the number of calories that people burn, is really noisy. It's quite bad. And so what that means is that the data that exists really won't ever be able to uh, you know, tell us with that level of detail uh, you know, the percent of the rise in obesity that's due to falling food prices versus maternal employment versus changes in income or anything else. But I don't want to make this sound like um, I don't want to be discouraging because in some ways we don't need to know what caused the rise in obesity to find ways of preventing and treating it. Right? We can find other approaches to, to dealing with it. And moreover, some of the things that may have contributed to the rise in obesity, we don't want to reverse. Right? So we don't want to turn back the clock and not have women in the labor force. Right? We may not want to uh, you know, be a Luddites and try and reverse technological change because of this unintended consequence of it. We want to adapt, uh, find other ways of reversing it than the factors that caused it potentially. Uh, so now to shift gears and talk, think about the consequences of obesity. Uh, so before I started studying the topic, I always just thought of uh, fat as just extra weight you carried around, you know, this inert stuff. Um, but in fact, fat collectively is an endocrine organ that's releasing hormones into our body. And these hormones are damaging our health. 
So for example, fat re releases the hormone resistin, which causes insulin resistance and thus type 2 diabetes. Uh, fat releases leptin, which causes cardiovascular disease. So this is why obesity contributes to premature mortality. So the World Health Organization estimates that obesity and overweight combined are responsible for 2.8 million deaths per year. And in the US, this represents 365,000 people every year. So as a, a researcher at the Center for Disease Control described it to me, that number, 365,000 deaths in the US every year just from obesity, is equivalent to a fully three fully loaded jumbo jets crashing every single day. Right? And so the CDC researchers said, imagine if that was actually happening. Imagine if three fully loaded jumbo jets crashed every single day in the United States. There'd be an outcry. There'd be demands for changes to airline safety. The problem is that the deaths from obesity, they're not that salient. Right? So they're happening from multiple causes. Some people are dying of heart disease. Some people have stroke. Others have cancer. And it's happening behind closed doors. So it's not dramatic, but the numbers truly are staggering. Now, in terms of the financial costs of obesity, they're frequently divided into two categories. So the first are the direct medical care costs of obesity. So in other words, just sort of the bill from treating people's obesity-related illnesses uh, in the healthcare sector. And then another category are the labor market impacts. So these include things like higher job absenteeism, people missing work because they're in poor health. But it also includes things like uh, people having lower wages. So some of the first work that I did on uh, the economics of obesity concerned the labor market consequences of obesity. So there's interesting gender patterns and, and race patterns in the, the labor market consequences of obesity. So if you just look at the correlations, women who are heavier in the US tend to earn less. And interestingly, that's not necessarily true for men. So there's actually something that has been called the portly banker effect, where middle-aged men who are overweight earn more than middle-aged men who are, who are lighter. Right? And so it's almost like it's a signal that you've made it. You don't have to look good for anybody. And you're not judged on that basis by customers or an employer. And women don't have that luxury. Right? So at least in the data, uh, it's like that saying, you can never be too rich or too thin. Um, you know, women who are lighter earn higher wages. And the question is, though, is that just a correlation or is it causal? Because it could be that um, you know, there's just something that's different about heavier women than lighter women that makes them earn less. And so taking advantage of a natural experiment of the heritability of weight, the fact that a large percentage of our weight is genetic in origin, about half of the variation across people in weight is due to their genes, was able to take advantage of that as a natural experiment. And what I, what I estimated is that uh, obesity lowers wages for white females by 11.2%. And that's the effect of obesity alone. It's not due to any other differences you might think about, like differences in education or intelligence or uh, you know, work effort or things like that. Uh, so it was really greatest for white females, lesser for black and Hispanic females, with no penalty observed for, uh, for males. So life is not fair, as I'm sure you already knew. Uh, another, in, another sort of labor market impact of obesity is that it's, uh, in the U.S., it's actually impairing military readiness. So with a colleague, Catherine McLean, we've studied the data and found that the, um, the percentage of U.S. civilians who are eligible to join the military. So the military has very strict weight for height restrictions as well as percent body fat restrictions. So the, the military has definitely caught on that BMI is a flawed measure of obesity because they, don't, they were historically disqualifying people from the Marines for being too muscular because they were so heavy for their height that on the charts they, they seemed excessively heavy. So they've now uh, got this sort of uh, uh, safety valve where you can exceed the weight for height charts as long as your percent body fat isn't too high. But even with that adjustment, increasing percentages of Americans are too heavy to join the military. And this has actually been impairing military readiness because before the recession, the U.S. Army, in the midst of unpopular wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, was actually failing for the first time in a generation to fill its ranks, was missing its recruitment quotas. And part of the reason is rising obesity. So obesity in the U.S. is now the number one reason that the military rejects applicants. A distant number two is past drug use. Uh, so this is a, a rising problem for the military. And interestingly, when I present this, people are frequently kind of happy with this unintended consequence. That, oh, so the U.S. can't go invading anywhere else. Uh, are we supposed to be sad about that? <clears throat> so a variety of researchers have estimated the uh, direct medical care costs of obesity for different countries. So as you can see here, studies have been completed for Australia, Canada, England. A uh, great study done here in Ireland by uh, Anne D., uh, uh, Kieran O'Neill, and... Uh, uh, Adele Darty, among others, and uh, also done for Scotland, and a colleague and I have, uh, have estimated them for the United, the United States. Now, each of these studies uses a different data set, uses different methods, so it can actually, again, be, be difficult to compare across countries. You don't want to draw too strong of a conclusion about these differences. 
But something that you can take away is that for these countries that, again, I think are sort of the peers of, the, of Ireland, of the United States, in every one of these countries, the direct medical care costs of obesity are really quite high and represent a non-trivial percentage of the overall health care budget of that country. We can also look across countries in terms of the job absenteeism costs or the indirect costs of obesity. Uh, and again, the, the report by Andy and Kieran O'Neill and, and uh, Adele Doherty is, is really useful here. Um, and again, these numbers are, are really quite high. It's hard to make comparisons across because of the different methods and the different data sets, but in every one of these countries, there are really uh, quite staggering costs to productivity uh, of rising obesity. So uh, let me go into a little bit of, uh, of detail in, in the study that I conducted on the medical care costs of obesity in the U.S., just because it illustrates like the economic approach to uh, econometrics. So the goal with the study that we conducted was um, to add a, a study that was able to measure the causal effect of obesity on health care costs. So previous studies had looked at the United States and just simply estimated the correlation of obesity with health care costs. And what I mean by that is just how much higher are health care costs for obese individuals relative to healthy weight individuals. And so that's a helpful number to have, certainly, but it may not reflect the actual causal effect of obesity on health care costs. So for example, you could imagine that the correlation could be an overestimate of the causal effect. So suppose I'm a, a roofer, a, a construction worker, and I fall off a ladder, injure my back. Well, the back injury is going to be very expensive, potentially, and it's also going to limit my physical activity and might cause me to gain weight. So you might see me five years later as an obese individual with high health care costs and think, aha, look at the high health care costs of obesity. But it's really not the health care costs of obesity. It's the consequences of a back injury that led to obesity and led to high medical care costs. On the other hand, correlations can sometimes be an underestimate because as um, Dr. O'Brien pointed out, um, in many cases, uh, people of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to be obese. And if they have relatively little access to health care, then we may see relatively low costs to obesity because these people find it hard to get to a good hospital, hard to get to a good doctor. And so the causal effects could be quite different than the correlations. So our approach was to look for some sort of natural experiment. Because again, like in an ideal world, of some sort, you would uh, you could be able to conduct a randomized control trial, right? Where you'd, you'd draw in a large number of people, randomly assign them to treatment and control, and you'd force the treatment group to become obese simply so you could see what their health care costs were 10 years later. So obviously that's unethical. We're not ever going to be able to do that. And so if we want to be able to measure the causal effects of obesity on health care costs, we have to look for some kind of natural experiment, something that created variation in obesity that was beyond people's control. And so here, we use the same approach that I described using earlier to study the causal effect of obesity on labor market outcomes. So here, we use the heritability of weight as a natural experiment. So epidemiologists sometimes call this Mendelian randomization, like Mendel being the person who first studied genes. Uh, before we're ever born, we're endowed by our parents with a certain mix of their, of their two DNAs. And as a result, for reasons beyond our control, some of us are endowed with a greater likelihood, a greater propensity to becoming obese than others. And as I mentioned, it's about half the variation across people that's due to uh, genetics. And by taking advantage of this natural experiment, we can solve two problems. So one problem is the problem of uh, selection or endogeneity. Like I mentioned before, we can, we can avoid counting uh, costs due to back injuries that led to obesity as part of the cost of obesity, and it can also address the problem I mentioned earlier, which is reporting error in weight that can lead to bias and coefficient estimates. So by using this approach, um, what we calculate is that obesity in the U.S. raises annual medical care costs of adults by $2,741 per year. So in other words, it raises their medical care costs by 160%. So to make that a sort of more, to use a more concrete example, the average medical care costs for a non-obese adult are $1,700 per year. The average health care costs for an obese adult are $4,500 per year. So this struck me as a really large number, but in talking more to clinicians, it actually seems quite plausible. So for example, I was talking to a surgeon and asking her about uh, the extent to which obesity raises costs in her practice. And she said that um, th their anesthesiologist is so concerned about um, breathing problems in obese patients that routinely now the anesthesiologist has an obese patient after surgery spend a day in the ICU. So an additional day in the ICU is thousands of dollars in the U.S. And so that would alone you know, explain this differential uh, that we observe. The costs of obesity, according to our estimates, are higher for women than men. They're over $3,600 per year for women, just $1,100 per men. And you can see that the costs are higher sort of across the board of category of care. Uh, it, it implies higher costs in inpatient care, prescription drugs, and outpatient care. So if you add up all these costs for the U.S. for a year, 
it totals $190.2 billion, or one in five dollars that's spent on healthcare in the United States. So um, I also wanted to just show you uh, how medical care costs uh, vary across BMI unit in our study. So the vertical axis here are total medical expenditures per person per year, and the horizontal axis is BMI, and the, the vertical lines are the cutoffs for healthy weight, overweight, and obese. So this dark blue line that you see here that looks like a U, that's your uh, estimated health care costs for that level of BMI. And so something that's really quite remarkable is in this graph is the minimum uh, medical expenditures are found at the BMI of 30. So in other words, what medicine says makes you obese, we actually find for men to be the lowest medical care costs. And note that too that this, this graph is U-shaped. So it's uh, the uh, health care cost consequences of underweight are quite high, as are the health care costs of obesity. So one thing to take away from this graph is that obese, the obese category is extremely heterogeneous. Some men who are obese have extremely low medical care costs. And other people who are morbidly obese in the range of 35 to 40 have extremely high medical care costs. So in thinking about saving money on the medical care costs of obesity, you want to target your interventions to people who are morbidly obese, BMI of 35, 40, and higher. You aren't much savings going to be derived from focusing your attentions on people whose BMI is 30, 31, just over the threshold. So again, just keep in mind that for men, this uh, graph of estimated expenditures over BMI is U-shaped. And here's the graph for women. So it's not U-shaped. So once again, you can never be too rich or too thin. Uh, we do not see that extremely light women have higher health care costs than men have. And again, you see this point that even though medical care costs are rising throughout the BMI range, for women just over the threshold of obesity, a BMI of 30, they're really not that high relative to healthy weight women. But it's when your BMI is in the range of 40, you're morbidly obese, that they're really uh, exponentially higher than people of healthy weight. So again, the, the, the sort of lesson from this is that the real savings lie in changing the behavior, uh, changing the weight of very high ob uh, obese uh, individuals, and not those just over the threshold. So I mentioned before that, that one advantage of economics is that it offers some clarity uh, about when the government should intervene in markets. So uh, in economics, we have something called the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which states that when markets are working perfectly, they're working, uh, there's perfect information, there's no search costs, all items are identical, there's no externalities, then there's really no rationale for the government to intervene in the market, right? So if you think of like a stock exchange, every share of the stock is identical, there's perfect information, uh, there's virtually no transactions costs, there's no reason for the government to intervene and try and mess with the prices of individual stocks, the market works fine. Um, but if there are market failures, then there's an economic rationale for intervening. And when it comes to diet, physical activity, and obesity, there are, in fact, several market failures, uh, which I'll mention in just a second. But this rationale is also helpful because it's helpful for, helpful for thinking about what defines success. Because one thing that, that isn't really clear is what's the ideal prevalence of obesity for Ireland? Right? What should the rate of obesity be here? Uh, what should the rate of obesity be in the U.S.? I mean, you could be arbitrary and you could say, like, well, whatever it was 20 years ago before it started rising. But why is that correct? Or is it realistic to say it's ever going to be zero, right? So one nice thing about this rationale is that it helps you understand what the right prevalence of obesity should be. It's what people choose as a result of their decisions when they have full information, there's no externalities, uh, and there's no other market imperfections. So let me just describe some of the market failures that are really relevant for obesity. I mentioned before imperfect information. So this is relevant because a lot of the time when we're deciding what food to eat, we really lack important information about how many calories are in that food, how many grams of fat, what are the vitamins, what are the minerals, how much fiber. And so this is a really good rationale for um, the government to require that packaged foods contain nutrition panels, like nutrition facts panels, uh, information on the packaged food that tells you how many calories, how much fat, how many vitamins and minerals. Um, another option along these lines is to have menu labels, so require chain restaurants to list across from every single menu item how many calories, how many, how many uh, calories from fat, and so on, so people can just make informed decisions. Uh, so with Jay Varayam at the U U.S. Department of Agriculture, he and I uh, estimate that the nutrition facts panel, so this is the uh, calorie information that was put on packaged foods in the U.S. in the mid-1990s, that that helped avoid 3.36 percentage points less obesity for white females, but we don't find that the addition of these panels had any impact on uh, the obesity of other groups. So again, sort of interesting race-gender differences in obesity and the effects of government policies. Uh, now, New York City, a few years ago, started requiring that chain restaurants operating there list calorie content and so on, 
uh, this uh, policy was evaluated by Brian L. Bell at NYU and others, and they find really little, if any, impact on people's calorie intake from having these menu labels. The U.S. is about to enact a, a nationwide menu label law that's part of the um, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Uh, and so nationwide in the U.S., people are going to have this information when they're ordering from a chain restaurant. Um, and so, again, I just want to point out that even though these menu labels don't seem to have changed behavior in New York City, that doesn't mean they're a failure. So from an economic point of view, if we've provided the missing information that people previously didn't have when they were deciding about what to eat, and now people are making informed decisions, that's still progress, that people are making informed decisions. Success isn't judged by how much less people eat. Success is judged by whether we've solved the market failure that we identified. Another market failure um, that would justify government intervention is if people are acting irrationally. And this is a really uh, tricky uh, criterion to use because there's a real slippery slope to paternalism. So you can think of, um, uh, for example, the prohibition movement in the US uh, in the 1880s through uh, the, the 1930s uh, would just argue that people cannot rationally consume alcohol and therefore all sales of alcohol just have to be banned in the United States. And this argument was very persuasive. And in retrospect, this is seen as very paternalistic. Uh, and the risk is that people can sort of grab onto this rationale as a way to just oppose, uh, enact policies against anything that they personally disagree with. But I think that we can agree that children are less rational than adults. We'd at least like to think so. Uh, certainly, uh, they're less able to take into account the future consequences of their actions. And so I'm very sympathetic, for example, to banning uh, food advertising to children because it, studies have shown that children cannot distinguish an advertisement from the actual content of the programming. They don't know they're being advertised to. And clearly, food companies often try very much to uh, get lifelong consumers at a very young age. Uh, and so Quebec, uh, many countries in Scandinavia, have banned food advertising to children. This is actually legally very difficult in the US, because in the US, there's, there's a, a principle called uh, commercial free speech in which it's believed that companies have as much right to free speech as individuals. And so who are we to tell uh, a company that they can't uh, speak to children about their products? Um, now, another uh, market failure that's very relevant for obesity is the concept of external costs. And what I mean by that is that some of those healthcare costs of obesity that I described earlier, they're borne by uh, others. They're not purely borne by the obese individual themselves. Uh, all of society is helping to pay those higher medical care costs. So in any system of national health insurance, any kind of group health insurance, uh, the obese don't pay higher premiums as a result of, of their weight. And so as a result, everybody else is paying premiums that subsidize the health care costs of the obese. And again, it's, obese is a heterogeneous group. The people who are just over the threshold of obesity are not incurring very many health care costs, but the people who are morbidly obese are. So for example, in the US, Medicaid is the public health insurance program for low-income individuals. And uh, we estimate that uh, Medicaid is spending an additional $3,521 per obese adult per year uh, on obesity-related illness. So clearly, taxpayers are bearing a significant amount of the cost of, of obesity. And the result of this is, is partly that you know, people are paying for the decisions made by others, but it also means that the individual at the point of decision-making has less of an incentive to um, adhere to a healthy diet, less incentive to engage in physical activity because they're not bearing all the costs. And so as a result, we have underinvestment in obesity prevention. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, now switch to, uh, you know, how can we use economics to, um, to design treatment and prevention programs? So, well, one way that we can help inter ex internalize external costs is to offer carrots, uh, or sticks, right? So carrots are rewards and sticks are punishments. So the list of carrots includes uh, workplace wellness programs like Dr. O'Brien mentioned earlier. So in the, U in the US, uh, companies are increasingly seeing that they can save money by improving the health of their employees, decreasing job absenteeism, decreasing these healthcare costs of obesity. And so in many cases, they're offering financial rewards for weight loss. So telling their employees who are overweight and obese, if you can lose certain amounts of weight, we'll just give you cash as a reward. And so uh, my colleague uh, Joshua Price and I have studied one such program. Uh, it's very large, uh, many thousands of people, operates across the United States. And what we find is very high attrition. So in this program that was completely voluntary, in which people could just earn bonuses for achieving their own weight loss goals, half the people dropped out in the first quarter of the year-long program, and 75% of people dropped out by the end of the year. And the people who stayed, the pe the, on the whole, uh, the people offered financial rewards for weight loss didn't lose any more weight than the control group. So really modest results, high attrition uh, and low weight loss. But people who put up their own money that was then refunded to them if they achieved their weight loss goals did lose more weight. So it seems like loss aversion 
is this concept that we can exploit. So make people put up their own money, and people are more motivated to not lose their own money than they're excited about earning somebody else's money. Now, another option is to, is to wield a stick, a penalty for not adopt, adopting healthy behaviors. And in the US, uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is going to allow group health insurance companies to charge overweight and obese individuals 30% higher insurance premia if they won't enter a weight loss program. So this is something that's taking effect this year in 2014, and so we'll see how that uh, incentive works. Another sort of more current or trendy uh, approach is to offer neither a carrot nor a stick, but a nudge. And so this is a, a sort of, the, the name comes from a book by uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. And the concept behind nudges is to really alter people's choice architecture. So the argument is, is that all the choices that we are exposed to in the world uh, have an architecture to them. Some of them are more prominent than others. And so the idea behind nudges is just rearrange the way that choices are presented to us and make the healthier option more appealing, make it easier to choose, but without limiting people's choice set. So one, uh, one sort of uh, commonly used example of this is in the Google cafeteria where they've uh, moved away energy dense foods from right near the cashier so that people aren't tempted to take high energy, high energy dense foods on a spur of the moment impulse at the end of their uh, sort of cafeteria run. Uh, another uh, example is that in, in Google they offer these uh, sort of glass jars of snacks that people can just graze on at all times. So they took the uh, M&Ms out of a clear jar where people could see them and moved them to an opaque jar and M&M consumption went down. So it's only a nudge, they're not telling you you can't have the M&Ms, they're still there, but they're making it easier to choose, for example, dried fruits which remain in a glass jar. So other ways that we can internalize external costs are, for example, to tax body weight directly. Right? So if, if pollution is causing a problem, we might want to tax people for emitting pollution. So you might take that same logic and apply it to weight. If uh, morbid obesity is raising health care costs, maybe we should just tax morbid obesity. Uh, I'm going to set that aside as politically unattractive. Um, and also, uh, you know, part of, as I said, like half the variation in weight across people is genetic in origin. Is it really fair to tax people uh, on the basis of something that they didn't choose? But an option, though, is to tax energy-dense foods, so to tax uh, soda pop, for example. So Ireland had a tax on soda pop from 1916 to 1992. Uh, Denmark had a fat tax, a tax on items high in saturated fat from 2011 to 2012. They actually ended up having to drop it because so many Danes crossed the border to Germany to buy their high-fat foods and then brought them back. So in a small jurisdiction, it's really easy to evade uh, these kinds of, uh, of taxes. In the U.S., we have certain localities, certain states that have small soft drink taxes, and when those have been evaluated by uh, Jason Fletcher of Yale, uh, they found really no detectable impact of these soft drink taxes on weight. And so what people can conclude from that, I think, depends on their, their predisposition. Some people see that result, that the existing taxes have no effect on weight, and conclude, well, that just means we have to have bigger ones, and other people look at it and say, well, that shows there's no evidence that this works at all. And so whether you think this means we should move on to something else or simply double down and try to have even larger taxes is sort of a matter of opinion. And then finally, another way that we can internalize external costs is to subsidize physical activity. And this is something that we do do. Uh, Government-funded parks, for example, represent a subsidy to physical activity. Public, uh, public school sports teams, public school physical education and recess also represent tax dollars going in to subsidize physical activity. Uh, so in the U.S., we've been interested in the extent to which physical education programs in schools make kids more physically active and, and represent a sort of obesity prevention program. Many of the U.S. states have been raising their physical education requirements in the wake of rising obesity. And so we take advantage of the uh, difference across states in these requirements as a natural experiment. And what we actually find is for most grades, there's no evidence that increased physical education in schools is reducing kids' weight. So the one exception is that boys in the fifth grade, we do see this protective effect but for kids in elementary school, other kids in elementary school, kids in high school, we don't find it. And part of the reason may be that the PE, the physical education, is relatively low in quality. So PE has been criticized by the Department of Health and Human Services for very often consisting of little more than teachers sort of rolling balls out and letting kids play. And if kids want to be sedentary, they can. And there was one study in a, a, a kindergarten uh, PE class where they, they actually clocked the number of minutes the kids were actually active, and it amounted to less than 8% of the time kids were actually physically active in gym class. The rest of the time was changing or standing around or getting instructions. So maybe the problem is that we need to improve uh, the PE uh, curriculum. And then finally, I would say that an important way that we can help internalize external costs is at a minimum, just stop making things worse. Uh, so for example, uh, agriculture policies, they differ across countries and they differ even within countries, but many of them in the US lower the prices of energy dense foods. There's actually, um, Part of the agriculture, agriculture policy in the U.S. is to collect money from each different producer of things like pork, milk, 
uh, beef, and then use that money to subsidize the production of uh, items that will increase demand for those items. But in practice, this has gone, in, in many cases, to fast food uh, chains to develop new menu items and advertise those new menu items. So with this government collected money, some of this research and development money went to the Pizza Hut to develop uh, a, che a, a cheese that contains one pound of cheese per pizza and went to uh, McDonald's to develop the McRib sandwich. And so while the one hand of the government, the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, are telling Americans to eat more healthy, the US Department of Agriculture is subsidizing you know, the production of energy-dense foods and actually increasing uh, the number of menu items at fast food restaurants and helping to advertise them. Another uh, problem in the US is that our food stamp program, which is a, a sort of direct food aid program for low-income individuals, allows people to buy ba basically any grocery items that they want. It can't be prepared food, but it can be bags of uh, cookies, it can be bags of chips, it can be uh, soda pop. And so restricting this program to only allow people to buy uh, nutritious, low-energy dense foods might be a really sensible, easy thing that we can do. So that seems to be a, a great place for me to stop, uh, given the limits on time. Uh, cost effectiveness is another economic tool that's really important, but uh, 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 Francis will be, t will be talking about that later. And uh, there's some uh, sort of takeaway points at the end, and, and maybe we can just put the slides online somewhere so people can download them later if they like. But thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here.
on the back. And uh, my name is Adele Dormady, and I'm chairing the next session. So I'm um, excited to chair a session which looks like five very interesting talks. So I'm going to ask the speakers to keep the time as much as possible. And at the very end, after all the talks, I'm going to invite the speakers up at the end for questions and answers. So first of all, um, I'm going to invite Michelle Queenley to give her talk. She's a PhD student in the discipline of economics. And she's going to talk about individual preferences for obesity treatment. So thanks, Michelle. So um, my name is Michelle Queen, as Adele said, and I'm a second year of economics PhD student here at NUI, whereby my PhD examines the health economics of obesity, and I'm jointly supervised by Professor Kieran O'Neill and Dr. Francis Newcomb. So I'm very, very grateful to be given the opportunity to present um, part of that research in front of such a, a room full of so many obesity experts, so I better not screw it up. But, uh, and also, I guess in particular, to be sharing the stage with Professor John um, Cawley, who I guess um, I got a bit starstruck at the beginning, but I'm getting used to him. But, so what I'm going to present today is um, a little bit different to what you might hear in terms of other pr um, presentations. It's from the patient pr perspective. So. Essentially what I'm exploring is patient preferences around obesity treatment and what I'm going to present today is one part of that research and that is using discrete choice experiments to elicit preferences for obesity treatment in an obese cohort of people. So I'm sure most of you haven't heard of what discrete choice experiment means but I'll explain it further on in the presentation. In terms of obesity, I guess there's no need to introduce it at this stage. Um, the negative health and economic consequences of obesity on both the individual and on society have been well documented and we're hearing all about that today. And it's widely accepted that the increasing prevalence of obesity and the seriousness of associated comorbidities warrant the, um, the, the approach of cost-effective approaches to deal with obesity. And there is evidence around what might be a cost-effective approach to both treating and preventing obesity in the form of various cost-effectiveness analysis that have been undertaken around drugs and interventions. There is also evidence that these interventions to reduce the prevalence of obesity can reduce morbidity and mortality of the obese individual. However, the evidence on the value and acceptability in terms of the patient's preferences around obesity treatment is less well documented. So with that in mind, my research question is to, is to investigate preferences of obese individuals for obesity treatment. And the aims of the particular project were firstly to identify the key components of weight loss programs and to explore what value people placed on these components, such as, um, you know, is the method of weight loss the most important thing to an obese individual or is the, the cost or the effort or the time it takes more important to them? And then we aim to estimate the willingness to pay for each of these attributes. And so attributes is just like another word for a characteristic or component of the weight loss treatment. And finally then to evaluate how people trade off between each of the attributes. So how much is a person willing to give up one attribute to gain more of another? And the method in which I'm using is a discrete choice experiment, whereby this is a survey-based um, method that basically it seeks to elicit what people's preferences might be around a particular good and service. Um, so I guess I could be an hour trying to explain what discrete choice experiment is, um, but I think it's best explained by way of example. So, if, say, tomorrow we want to book you going out of here and you need a holiday and you're booking, say, the Bahamas or wherever, and you've got a choice of three airlines. So discrete choice theory basically assumes that our choice or our decision is influenced by the attributes or characteristics that make up that particular good or service. So in the case of the airline, it's assumed that your decision was based around the attributes that make up that airline. So some of which might include check-in service, entertainment, legroom, and so on and so forth. So now let's say, for example, I'm Michael O'Leary and um, recently voted worst customer service in the world. And I might say, hey, you know, cost isn't the only thing that's affecting people's decisions. And I want to understand people's behavior more around what they're willing to pay for each of the attributes. And also what is actually important to people um, when they are choosing an airline. I might conduct a discrete choice experiment. Um, so the discrete choice experiment involves designing a choice card which incorporates these attributes and various levels of the attributes. And it might look something like that, a very simple version of that. So down along the left-hand side of the slide, we see the attributes that we've seen in the previous slide, such as the check-in service, entertainment, food and drink. And we also include a cost attribute, and that's to estimate um, what people place or how much value they place on each of the attributes. And in essence, we're asking people in a hypothetical scenario, which airline would you choose taking into account 
the attributes and the various levels of those attributes. So I'll come back to this in more detail in a few moments, but I suppose we're not talking about airlines, we're talking about obesity. So the survey that was given out as part of the pilot has six sections altogether. The first section examines um, some attitudinal questions. You know, what does the respondents think the government spending on obesity ought to be? We also look at their, um, as Professor Cawley mentioned earlier, um, what they perceive their health to be in relation to um, what their actual health is. And because we're looking at health risks, we look at, um, or we give a risk tutorial, that, and the purpose of that is to explain and ensure people understand what's meant by health risk, and also so we can gauge whether or not they might be a risk-averse or risk-taking person. The next section is the choice cards, which I will come to. Um, some socioeconomic variables were also asked. And the final section, um, which is the healthcare utilization of the respondents. So how often have you visited the GP or the dietitian over the past 12 months? And this section is essentially um, to inform another part of my study alongside my PhD, which is the cost effectiveness analysis of bariatric surgery. And um, I'll leave that to my supervisor to explain in more detail. So for now, I'm gonna focus on the choice cards, which are in essence what make up a discrete choice experiment. So these are the attributes and levels that were defined from a patient. So first of all, the attributes were defined from a patient perspective, and we see those down along the left-hand side of the table there. So these were um, finalized um, as a result of a serious numbers of interviews, in-depth in -depth interviews and focus groups that were held with obese individuals and also alongside the literature, of course. And each attribute is described by the number of levels. And these levels were informed again on, uh, alongside literature reviews and informed by medical expertise, um, albeit they are quite arbitrary, arbitrarily de defined. So if we look at the first attribute there is the amount of weight loss in 12 months, we see that these levels vary from two, four, six stone. So these attributes are essentially describing the weight loss treatment, what the weight loss treatment can provide to the individual. The next attribute is the risk reduction of fatal heart attack over a 10 year period. And these risks um, range from five to 25 um, and up to 30%. There is again, similar to the airlines, a cost attribute introduced um, whereby um, again, just referring back to Professor Cawley's, it's what the, they themselves would actually be willing to pay as opposed to what others would pay for their weight loss. So that ranges on a month from 20 euros to 85 euros, um, and they would pay that on a monthly basis regardless of their you know, private med or private me or pri medical card or private health insurance. The next attribute is the psychological services. So this is a binary yes or no um, answer. So this means whether or not the patient or the end user would have access to psychological services such as visiting the um, psychologist on a monthly basis. And the next um, attribute is the method of weight loss, which I think um, Professor O'Brien explained in enough detail. The drug therapy plus diet and lifestyle modification, um, diet and lifestyle modification on its own, and bariatric surgery. Those are the three methods of weight loss that are included in the choice card. So this is actually one of the choice cards or what the choice cards looks like in the survey. So down along the left-hand side of the table, we have the attributes, the five attributes that I've just gone through. And in essence, we're asking people in a hypothetical scenario, would they choose option A, B, or C? So I'll just draw your attention to option C, we can see is in fact a no weight loss program, which is whereby this is consistent throughout all the choice cards that um, this is option might be if they did not like option A or B, they couldn't afford it or they didn't want it. So you can see here that option C is a no weight loss program and there is no cost involved, but they no lose no weight. But because we're talking about an already obese cohort, they would have a risk, or a risk of heart attack. So in essence, by undertaking option A or B, you are reducing that risk and losing weight and so on and so forth. So what we're asking people in essence is to take into account all of those attributes and the levels of the attributes and to tick which option you would choose and how much you would be willing to pay for it. So if we just look at the first option, A, so if I was to choose this option, I would lose four stone. My risk of fatal heart attack over a 10-year period would be 12%, um, and the cost would be 30 euros to me, and I would have access to psychological services, and the method would be diet and lifestyle. So we ask people to tick that box. So altogether, patient, our patients are given 12 of these choice cards, one after the other, whereby the attributes remain the same and the levels are varied. So if we were to look at choice card two, we see how similar it looks, but the levels of A and B have varied. So they vary throughout the 12, the 12 choice cards. So I spoke about the um, population that completed this pilot survey. So I'm quite lucky 
um, in the fact that within 10 minutes walk from this building, I'm, I'm at access to the relevant population, that is the obese population required to complete the survey and indeed um, the discrete choice experiment. So the Department of Diabetes at Galway University Hospital, they run various weight management or obesity clinics and one of the weight management programs that they have commissioned the Cree Heart and Stroke Charity Foundation to deliver is a program that's called the Cree Clan program. So this is whereby our patients are referred from the Department of Diabetes to the Cree um, Heart and Stroke Building um, for, to take part in a 10-week diet and lifestyle intervention program that is nurse-led by a multidisciplinary team in this building. And in essence, this is where my sample population are from, and it was a total number of 41 um, participants who completed the pilot survey um, who were already enrolled in the um, diet and lifestyle modification program. So I'll just present some pre preliminary results around that pilot study for the next couple of slides. So some descriptive stats. Um, it's 41, so it, it's quite a small sample for, for the pilot. But in terms of the age, the majority of people were um, under 65, almost half male, half female. Um, in terms of the BMI, um, almost half of the population had a BMI of 45 plus, so they were morbidly obese. Um, in terms of educational attainment, it was quite low, with again almost half people having attained primary school only. Um, in terms of household income, again, it was at the lower end of the bracket, with almost half um, at that end of the lower end of the bracket. So this is just one question that was asked in the attitudinal question, and whereby I asked respondents how important do they think obesity spending is um, our government obesity spending ought to be relative to other areas and we see those other areas at the bottom of the slide mental health elderly care disability pediatric and cancer care and the, the the red color you see is basically the most common whereby they thought that government spending on obesity ought to be the same or relatively around the same but the black color um, that you see or I guess that you don't see is whereby respondents thought that obesity spending ought to be of greater importance than each of those and in particular they didn't think that for mental health or elderly care. So moving on, this is some of the econometrics that was done around the choice cards. So the random parameter loader model models the choices that people have made which is a function of the attributes. So we see the mean estimates down along the left hand side of the table. So if we just look at a few of the the outputs there. So if we look at the first one there, or the second one down, heart risk, um, we see this is a negative sign, if you can see that. Um, basically, this is whereby respondents, this is what we would have expected, because respondents would be less likely to choose um, a weight loss treatment that there would not be a significant, or a significant amount of reduction in the risk of heart attack. In terms of the preferred method, th the three methods that we looked at for weight loss treatment, um, so relative to doing nothing, and this is obviously, I don't think is any surprise, the most preferred um, method of weight loss is through diet and lifestyle modification. Um, and what may or may not come as a surprise is that the least preferred method of weight loss, whereby people thought of it as a very last resort in this cohort, was bariatric surgery. But if we look at the um, standard deviation around bariatric surgery, it is quite large, um, which, which represents the heterogeneity that um, exists around preferences for bariatric surgery. So if we move on up to the so-called willingness to pay that people state that they would pay, so just a reminder, it's not stating what they have paid, we see um, first of all the, the attribute that people are willing to pay the most for is a diet and lifestyle modification. of. They said that, they said that they're willing to pay um, on average 286 euros per month. In terms of psychological services, people say they're willing to pay 45 euros uh, per month. So, um, Adele, I'm not here in the five minutes, so I'm still there, okay. So, on the last slide, so I've loads of time for this. So, um, what have we learned from the study? So, I guess it is, um, it's, it's, it's a small study, it's a pilot study. There was, um, we didn't solve the theory of relativity or anything like that. Um, so, the objective of a pilot is to test for the feasibility of the larger scale pilot, and it did just that. There were no major issues in terms of people's comprehension of the choice cards or um, any other questions in any of the six sections that I outlined. So that's, I suppose, a good start. Um, in terms of the actual results that came from the, the sample size of 41, we found that relative to doing nothing in terms of their weight loss, people do want to do something, um, which again is probably no surprise, given the fact that these people are already enrolled in a diet and lifestyle program. 
And in essence, they wouldn't be enrolled there in the first place if they weren't motivated individuals. But what we did find is that there's large variance around what people's preferences are in relation to weight loss treatment. So perhaps the one size fits all approach to weight loss treatment is not, not the, the answer. So one of the um, attributes or aspects that came up from the initial onset of the study, that is um, from the, I was looking for five minutes now, so uh, from the focus groups right through to the interviews was the importance of mental health to people, whereby they are willing to pay a high amount for access to mental health services. Um, and in terms of attributing their own weight gain, um, quite a lot of people, um, the majority of people attributed to some, I guess, some, some aspect of mental health. So in terms of um, identifying future work, so I think this pilot study opened up the doors, um, well, to myself and many other areas of future work. Um, further analysis, um, I suppose, first of all, is to be conducted um, in terms of, for example, gender. So are men and women, is there a difference between what men or women would be willing to pay um, in terms of the different attributes for weight loss treatments? To look more at the socioeconomic variables and also take into account the risk variables, and as I've already mentioned, this um, project is to be rolled out to a larger scale population, but the pilot study was, was of those who were already enrolled in a program. So it'll be interesting to see um, obese patients who aren't enrolled in a program or indeed the general, pu the general public. So I think obesity is, uh, is an issue that I suppose has tapped on, on many doors, whether it's obesity itself or the comorbidities that are associated with obesity. So it might be interesting to see, you know, would you pay for your husband's treatment or your wife's treatment and so on and so forth. Um, so with that in mind, getting a view of the general public or non-obese public. In terms of the um, contribution of the work, so as I've mentioned already, it is just a pilot study, but in terms, it has informed the larger scale project, which in essence, I think when that's completed um, is definitely a contribution to the work uh, from I suppose the patient perspective in that this is the first study in Ireland of its type to look at um, patient preferences for obesity treatment and perhaps in the future it might be um, considered alongside the clinical trials or indeed when designing clinical trials for patient, or patient outcomes and also alongside cost effectiveness analysis. And that brings the end of my presentation. So, thanks. Thanks, Michelle, for a very interesting talk. So I'm going to invite Brendan Walsh, who's also a PhD student in the discipline of economics, and he's going to talk about socioeconomic inequalities in childhood obesity in Ireland. Perfect. Thanks, Adele. And uh, thanks, Brendan, for inviting me to speak on this topic today. Um, and Brendan told me to tell you all if you want to join in the conversation here or online um, using hashtag obesity problem to ask questions or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so this is a piece um, myself and John Cullinan from the uh, Cairn School of Business and Economics in Inuit Galway have undertaken. And slightly different than the previous speakers who, who focus mainly upon adults, um, we're going to talk about uh, childhood obesity in Ireland. Um, and in this analysis, we actually try to measure whether a socioeconomic inequality in childhood obesity exists. So as m m most of the um, presenters thus far have, have talked about, you know, obesity is a very large problem. This 18% is probably a, a, an underestimation of obesity prevalence in Ireland at the moment among adults. Um, but obesity, th th the impact of obesity really comes to light when we talk about um, things like diabetes, heart disease and cancer. So up to 41% of certain cancers um, can be attributed to uh, individuals who are overweight and obese. And as John has shown in a, in a previous study, that a, obesity may account for 20 to 21 percent of health spending in the United States. So, in terms of childhood obesity, research into this topic is it's relatively modern. Um, Welton et al. in 2007 carried out a um, carried out a study in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and within this study, about six percent of children um, were found to be obese. Um, Richard Late and others at the ESRI um, also conducted a study using the growing up in Ireland data as what. Um, we use in our um, analyses. They found that approximately 19% of nine-year-old children in Ireland were overweight and 17% were obese. The issue of obesity has also been highlighted at a governmental level, so the Joint Raptus Committee in April 2012 also highlighted a problem of obesity in children in particular. And the United States, while um, the issue of obesity among adults also um, leads to a lot of costs for the healthcare system, 
even among children, about $14.1 billion um, dollars annually is caused by childhood obesity. So many studies have shown in recent years that a reduction or a levelling off in obesity rates amongst children have occurred, especially in Europe. But these reductions have mainly occurred in the highest socioeconomic groups. So the importance of socioeconomic inequalities may actually be increasing in this context. While childhood obesity itself is a problem, the real impact of childhood obesity, again, is only seen when they become adults. So for a child of you know, recommended weight, about 15% of those will become obese. For a child who's seen as overweight or obese, 65% of those will become obese. And for an obese child, about 82% of those may become obese as adults. So it's, it's, it's a huge leap from 15% to 82%. And the question myself and John try to answer is, is there a socioeconomic gradient in childhood obesity, particularly in Ireland? Previous studies have found that the answer is yes. So as I said, Leit et al has shown this um, in, from an Irish context. Um, others in Europe, England and the United States have also shown that a socioeconomic gradient may exist, whether that be due to um, education of parents, um, socioeconomic class or the income of the household. So while childhood obesity, the socioeconomic gradient of childhood obesity is important, we know that other factors influence childhood obesity. So for example, mothers or fathers, parental um, BMI. So in our sample, just over 5% were seen as obese. For children whose mothers were of a recommended weight, about 2% of those were obese, while for children whose mothers were obese, almost 12% of those were obese. Again, across income, a similar but not quite as large gradient was observed. So for those in the lowest 20% of household income, about 7.5% of those children were obese, while in the um, households with, of the highest 20% of income, almost 3% were obese. But it's only when you start bringing in you know, different variables together that you see the, the, the largest difference and the intricacies um, across different groups. So for example here, when we partition across uh, parental BMI, mother's BMI and income, for children whose mothers of recommended weight and actually lives in a household of the top 20% of income earners in, in Ireland, less than 1% of those children are obese. While for children whose mothers are obese and live in the poorest 20% um, in terms of household income, 14% are obese. That's a huge difference. If we use a different um, socioeconomic measure, such as social class here, the gradient is actually bigger. So the difference between 0.34 and 17.78 is an odds ratio of like 54. So it's a very, very steep gradient. So to answer the question um, of whether socioeconomic inequality is used in our analyses, uh, in our analyses actually um, exists, we use the Growing Up in Ireland survey. So the Growing Up in Ireland survey um, measured 14, uh, included 14% of all nine-year-olds in Ireland in 2007-2008, and it gathered information concerning children, their caregivers, their parents, teachers, and school principals. In our analyses, um, the obesity, obesity is classified on the basis of the uh, IOTF 95th percentile, which John alluded to earlier. So it's based upon a historical um, survey of children. So about 5% of children historically were in the, the obese section, while the overweight cutoff is the 85th percentile. So about 15% historically were in the overweight or obese um, cutoff. A previous study has also shown that using this sort of cutoff instead of, say, the WHO or the CDC cutoffs, which are also used previously in the literature, may allow for a greater distinction between weight caused by body weight and muscle. So again, while BMI may not be perfect for adults, it may not be perfect for children either. Probably the best thing about the GUI survey, especially in an international context, it's, it's, it's unique in that it actually, the, survey, the people who carry out the survey actually measure the height and the weight of the children. It's not just self-reported. And they also measure the height and the weight of the parents and caregivers. And this is very unique in an international context, especially for children. So de to determine whether a socioeconomic gradient exists, instead of just looking at, say, the descriptive statistics, like we did previously, we're going to use this thing called a concentration index. So a concentration index is just an inequality index. It's used quite a, uh, quite a lot these days in health economics and in other areas of economics. So it really does exactly what it says on the tin. It measures how much a problem is concentrated in one part of the population compared to the other. For a concentration index, we partition individuals according to their income, so we rank people from poorest to richest. So then the concentration index here will allow us to determine whether childhood obesity is concentrated in poorer households or richer households. 
For our income variable, we use equivalised household income. And we equivalise it because that allows us to take the number of individuals who live in the household into account. For people who might have used this before, because we have a binary variable, we just need to normalise it. So we use the Wagstaff normalisation. There's other normalisations, such as those called by Erigers, and they've been used previously. But Wagstaff is what we use in ours. A good example to maybe put this clear in your mind is with something like public health insurance. So in Ireland, we would call this a medical card or Medicaid in the US. So if we were to carry out a concentration index or estimate a concentration index for a medical card, we would obviously see that medical cards are concentrated mainly among poor households. So it's the same sort of idea for obesity. We want to determine whether um, childhood obesity is concentrated more in poor or richer households. So in terms of how to interpret the concentration index, it's based upon the Gini coefficient, which is used quite a bit in terms of income inequalities in uh, economics. And it quantifies an inequality from your population. And it, it gives you an estimate between minus one and plus one. If your concentration index gives you a zero, that means there's no inequality. Um, childhood obesity would not be um, concentrated among poorer households or richer households. If you estimate a concentration index less than zero, so you're moving towards minus one, this means it's pro-poor, not pro in a good sense, but that it's disproportionately concentrated amongst poor households than richer households. And a concentration index greater than zero towards plus one means it's concentrated in richer households than poor households. So it's an easy, quantifiable, bivariate relationship, and it allows for um, inequalities to be compared across different groups, countries, um, health issues, uh, um, and a lot of different, um, different areas. So getting back to our medical card example, we would all expect for, say, a medical card to have a concentration index of less than zero, going towards minus one, because we know in our minds that medical cards are more concentrated amongst the poor. A concentration index, for example, of minus 0.10, tells us that the, the concentration of our health problem is in the poor families and that the 0.10 means to get back to perfect equality we would need to redistribute about 10 percent of health or obesity from the poorest half and give it to the richer half and then we'd have an inequality or a concentration index of zero and if we had a concentration index of minus 0.2 we just say that the inequality is twice as much as that of 0.1 so it's relatively easy to um to understand what might be a little tougher to understand is what we further do to the concentration index in terms of our decomposition analyses. So the decomposition analyses allows for greater information regarding what contributes to the inequality. So we use a range of different variables which would impact upon childhood obesity and our income. So the concentration index only gives you a measure between childhood obesity and income. But other things may be causing that inequality. It could be medical cards. It could be that the parents come from a lower socioeconomic class. They have lower educated and so forth. And the decomposition has two parts. The first part is the elasticity, and the second part is the concentration. So the elasticity is a common phrase in economics. It basically means that for a given change in one of your independent variables, how much will your Y variable or your dependent variable change? So for example, if a mother has a higher BMI, what impact will that have upon childhood obesity? The second part then is the concentration. And all this really do does is it calculates the concentration index again, which we did before for our obesity, but for all our other independent variables. When we multiply these together, it gives us a contribution. We then get a percentage contribution, which estimates what percentage of the inequality can be explained by that independent variable. So, for example, if we go back to parental BMI or mother's BMI, we would expect that childhood obesity may be disproportionately distributed among poorer households due to parental BMI. So, for example, parental BMI we know to be correlated to childhood obesity, that's our elasticity. But also parental BMI has been shown previously to be concentrated itself disproportionately among poorer households. So that's where the, the elasticity multiplied by the concentration comes into play. And then the decomposition takes this into account and it allows for the contribution of parental BMI on inequality in childhood obesity to be estimated. So income itself may only be a surrogate of uh, the inequality. Other things may actually be driving that inequality. So to get on to the results, using our GUI sample, and this is without weight, so it's slightly different than late's, um, late's results, just over 5% of our sample are obese. So 5% of nine-year-olds in Ireland are seen as obese. Overweight but not yet obese, just under 
But the vast majority of nine-year-old children in Ireland are still off the recommended weight, about 70%. And then approximately 7% are underweight. Descriptive statistics, instead of showing you every single variable we included in our analyses, I'm just going to concentrate on income, um, socioeconomic group, mother's education and BMI. So what we, I presented to you a few slides ago, if you're in a richer household, you're less, your child is less likely to be obese, about 2.5 times more likely to be obese in a poorer household. For socioeconomic group, those in uh, the lowest socioeconomic group are about 4.1 times more likely to be obese compared to those in the lowest socioeconomic group. And for BMI, if your mother is obese, um, you're about five, five and a half times more likely to be obese as a child compared to if she was recommended weight. These are just simple um, descriptive statistics. But the question we try to get at is, is there a socioeconomic gradient in, in childhood obesity using this method? And the answer is yes. So our concentration index for obesity, if we just concentrate on the second column, we have a minus number, which means that there is an inequality. It's, it's disproportionately um, in the poorest households and the richest households and it's 0.167. So in order to get perfect equality in childhood obesity in Ireland, we'd have to redistribute about 17% from the poorest households to the richest households. And this is statistically significant. Again, if we look at the 85th percentile cutoff, which is overweight obese, there's inequality, but it's not quite as pronounced, which makes sense. The, the, the further you go up the, um, the BMI distribution of children, the larger the inequality is going to be observed. So that gives us our inequality, a socioeconomic inequality exists, but we want to try and explain that further. So this is where the decomposition comes into account. In our analyses, we're going to use four different groups. We're going to group variables across four different groups, which are socioeconomic variables, parental level variables, household level variables, and child level variables. So the socioeconomic um, level variables we use are social class and parental education. The parental level variables are their age, the parents' BMI, smoking status, alcohol status, and whether they, they're currently breastfeeding or they breastfed um, um, after the birth of the child. Um, household level variables, which are, do you live in a rural or urban household? Does the, do your parents own your home? Um, is there quick access to grocery stores and recrea recreational activities? And then a host of childhood level variables, such as you know, gender, pocket money, the health of the child, whether they have a TV in the bedroom, how many hours of TV they watch, their diet, light, um, diet, physical e exercise, and birth weight. So we're controlling for a lot of different variables here. And in our results, we find that, perfect. In our results, we find that while we control for a lot of different variables in terms of childhood, child level and in terms of household, the vast majority of the inequality from our CI is explained by socioeconomic level variables and parental level variables. So things like socioeconomic group, education of the parent, parental BMI, smoking status, alcohol status, all together explain about 75% of all the inequality in childhood obesity. Child level variables explain, you know, 16.25%. But the vast majority of the inequality observed in childhood obesity is not at the childhood level, it's at the household level, it's at the parental level. So in conclusion, um, this is the first time a concentration index for childhood obesity has been undertaken in Ireland, and we find that um, a pro-poor or um, disproportionately poor socioeconomic gradient is observed for obesity and, and to, to a certain extent also for overweight obese. Inequalities in childhood obesity are larger than those seen in adults, which is uh, taken from Professor Madden's paper, although we use a slightly different methodology um, in our normalization. The results here highlight that a socioeconomic gradient exists, but this gradient is likely to have manifested itself in a complex multi-level manner. I suppose the take-home message from this is we're not tr trying to explain what causes childhood obesity because we'd be here for eternity maybe, but we're trying to identify whether a socioeconomic gradient exists and then we're trying to um, determine what causes that inequality, not childhood obesity per se. Um, and that the determinants of childhood obesity is clearly a multifaceted problem and it doesn't have a simple solution. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Brendan. Um, that was another excellent talk. So I'm going to move swiftly on. And Dr. Francis Finucan um, from University Hospital uh, Galway is going to present on the cost effectiveness of bariatric surgery.
So thanks very much indeed, Brendan, for the opportunity to speak to, to everybody today. Um, uh, the first thing I want to do is just to declare some conflicts. So like Professor O'Brien, I'm a founder and a director of a, a new company called Biolis, which is involved with structured lifestyle modification programs. Uh, I also serve on advisory boards and speakers bureaus, and I'm an investigator for a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk with you about the cost effectiveness of bariatric surgery over the next uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, so, you know, last year uh, the Irish Heart Foundation ran, ran an excellent seminar on the pros and cons of health related food taxes, and I was driving down from Galway. Normally I get the train, but on this occasion I was driving and pulled into a petrol station to, uh, to get some petrol for the, for the trip down and bought a cup of coffee as well, which I usually do. It's 195 there in Ballybrit, and uh, pretty nice coffee. And uh, when I went to the counter to, uh, to, uh, to, to pay for my coffee, the guy told me, listen, you know, for an extra five cents, you can have one of these big Kit Kat bars, you know, which made me reflect on the, uh, the sort of obesogenic environment and the, the sort of the challenges that people face in trying to lead a healthy life. Um, and what's, what's happened, as we all know and we've heard today, is that there's been a, a population shift in body mass index such that 61% of Irish adults are now overweight or obese. For the record, for anybody who's watching uh, um, uh, primetime on Monday evening, the, the, the prevalence in Finland is pretty high as well. 49% of adults there are, 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 are overweight or obese, and that's smack bang in the middle of the OECD uh, rankings uh, for countries. So, you know, uh, we can be a little oversimplistic at times in our approach to this, I think, and it's great to have, you know, a quality conversation today uh, uh, with people about this. Um, so, so there's no doubt that the, the, the obesity epidemic has arisen as a result of changes in, in, in human behavior over the last three decades or so. And what we see at the hospital level then is the tail end of that distribution. So if you look at American data from Sturm et al. published in 2007, if you look at the blue line on the bottom of this graph, you can see that between 1987 and 2005, uh, the prevalence of obesity in American adults went up by 200%. If you look at the yellow line then, which represents people with a body mass index over 40 or severely obese adults, they're, bariat uh, they're uh, patients with a BMI in the bariatric range, but that would represent typically the top 2% of a population, maybe slightly more in the States. But you can see here that the change in the number of people uh, with bariatric obesity was about fivefold, so an increase of 500% over that time. So that's dramatic, and, and so what we're seeing at the tail end of the distribution of the obesity epidemic is a dramatic rise in the demand for hospital-based services uh, for the management of very severely obese uh, patients. And there are a number of different interventions that we've developed, as uh, Michelle alluded to, to, to a collaboration we have with the, with Cree, the West of Ireland Cardiac Foundation. We've also, uh, our, our dietitian has established a very effective uh, um, low energy liquid diet for, for a certain subgroup of patients attending our clinic. It's by no means a, a panacea. Uh, but what I think the challenge for, for, for hospital-based services is to provide the right intervention to the right, in, uh, to the right patient at the right time. Our nuclear option is bariatric surgery. And for a small proportion of those 2% uh, of the population who are highly motivated to do something about their weight and the related metabolic uh, complications from that, then there's no doubt that uh, bariatric surgery is is a good choice, and uh, um, today is about cost effectiveness really, but, but it's worth emphasizing the evidence base uh, for the effectiveness clinically of bariatric surgery. Um, so there are different types of bariatric surgery, just to mention that this is a, a, a representation of banding, which was widely uh, used, you know, and still is widely used globally. Uh, we used that up until about four years ago. Uh, you know, the idea with banding is that you apply a device to the top of the stomach and that reduces, reduces the capacity of the stomach to, to, uh, to, to fit food in, basically, when people eat. And so, you, you know, you, you're left with a stomach, the stomach, the, the volume of the tips of two thumbs, basically. So people feel full very quickly after eating after this type of bariatric surgery. We've moved to a newer um, uh, procedure. Uh, our surgical colleagues have adopted this sleeve gastrectomy approach, and we've done over 100 of these procedures over the last three years in Galway now, where the busiest bariatric surgical unit in the country, if I'm not mistaken, over the last couple of years. And uh, we've had outstanding results with this intervention. Uh, I think because we're so careful about uh, the patients that we choose, they're typically attending our service for about two years before, they, uh, before we, we deploy this, this operation. 
and uh, you know we've had we've had outstanding results. Not perfect. Sometimes uh, we find that patients, uh, in retrospect, were not good candidates for surgery. But we'd like to think that we're pretty good at identifying people who are good candidates, and we get it right most of the time, uh, like like other centres. So the sleep gastrectomy, the idea there is that you reduce the size of the stomach by about 85%. Uh, again, it makes people feel fuller, quicker after eating. It's likely also to have an effect on how hungry they feel. And there may be other uh, interesting mechanisms in relation to uh, removing that part of the stomach, how it influences physiology, how it influences how people feel about food. So we talk about free will in terms of uh, Kit Kats and that sort of thing, but uh, the, uh, the, the fact is that, that this influences behavior, it influences physical activity levels and energy expenditure, this operation. So uh, we don't fully understand the benefits of bariatric surgery. But we do know, for example, that it leads to you know, uh, incomparable weight loss compared to any other intervention like lifestyle intervention or, uh, or, or medication. So over a you know, sustained period of time, as per this graph in the Swedish Obesity Study published in 2007, you can see that there's very significant weight loss, about 20%, and that's sustained over a period of a couple of decades. Okay, so that's, that's very promising uh, compared to other, other weight loss interventions. But weight loss is one thing. What, what about other, other outcomes, more important and relevant outcomes, uh, like mortality? So, uh, you know, bariatric surgery is really the first uh, intervention for weight loss uh, that's been shown to reduce mortality, in fact. And that's probably just because it has a huge effect size, uh, uh, and so that becomes apparent early on. But you can see here that, again, in the SOS study from Sweden, there was a 24% reduction in mortality after a follow-up period of about 16 years, and that was statistically significant, and that's been borne out by other studies. So it's effective as a weight loss intervention. Uh, it saves lives. All right. Uh, also, more recently then, studies have shown that in patients with diabetes, it causes remission of diabetes in a substantial proportion of those patients, uh, and where they don't have full remission of their diabetes, they have a significant improvement in their diabetes control. Uh, they require fewer medications for their diabetes, and uh, that's, that's, that's clearly very important for, for those patients who have diabetes who've got severe obesity. That's a body mass index over 35, according to the current guidelines. Who, um, who benefit greatly from this procedure. Um, and we've identified in our cohort of diabetes patients attending the university hospital across the road that there's about, uh, there's about 800 patients or thereabouts who would you know, technically fulfill the criteria for bariatric surgery uh, because they have type 2 diabetes and they've got that BMI over 35. Clearly only a small proportion of those would want surgery uh, or would be deemed suitable for it after psychological assessment. And often lifestyle intervention or a modified diet is the appropriate choice. But there are a small subgroup of those patients who, who, who certainly would benefit from surgery. And the fact of the matter is that nationally and, and regionally, we don't have the capacity to do as much of this surgery as we'd like. And that's a, something we'd like to change. And hopefully today we'll convince people that that's, um, that's something that's worthwhile uh, to invest in. So, sorry, just to say this, this was a, a paper from the New England Journal, back-to-back uh, -back with a similar paper from an Italian group, but just showing that there's normalization of a blood test called the HbA1c, or glycated hemoglobin, which is our index of how, uh, how somebody's average blood sugar level has been over the previous 12 weeks or so. So you can see that this uh, pretty much normalizes. Um, so in patients who've had sleeve gastrectomy, like our patients, for example, it goes from 9.5%, which is pretty bad, to 6.6%, which is pretty good. And about 40% about of those patients have complete remission of their diabetes. Their blood sugars are normal. They don't need medications. Okay, so it's, cost, sorry, it's effective and efficacious uh, on so many levels, bariatric surgery, in terms of life saved, uh, diabetes improvement, other comorbidities like sleep apnea, and it also it happens to, to reduce weight as well. And there have been lots and lots of uh, uh, papers in the literature over the last 20 years or so addressing the sort of the cost effectiveness then, a critically important consideration for bariatric surgery. Uh, some of them, like this uh, Italian narrative review published a couple of years ago, are sort of, you know, they, 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 they're okay. They're not particularly scientifically rigorous, but they're interesting. Uh, then there are other uh, rigorous studies, like this one uh, from the States, which uh, demonstrated that uh, bariatric surgical procedures are, are, are cost-effective, all right, um, not necessarily cost-saving, but uh, 
this particular study looked at the difference between laparoscopic operations or keyhole operations and uh, operations where people had to have, you know, their tummy opened up and uh, an open procedure. And there was a big difference in the cost, uh, the quality adjusted life year or the, the cost for quality adjusted life year, the so-called incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So that's an important concept, the ICER. That's, um, that's a way health economists uh, and people who make decisions about whether or not uh, interventions are worth the investment, that's how they sort of quantify uh, whether something uh, good enough to invest in. So it takes account of um, the relative cost of a new intervention like bariatric surgery compared to uh, the cost of other interventions previously. So it's the change in the cost, but also the change in the effectiveness. So it's, it's one over the other and that gives you an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And when you're looking at that, you, you, you want to compare like with like. So in terms of the benefits of an intervention, uh, they measure something called a quality adjusted life year. So they, take, uh, they, they look to see how much does something improve a patient's quality of life uh, and the quantity of life as well. So, so that, that's, uh, that's, that's important to consider. And so all of these studies, every single study in the literature shows that bariatric surgery is cost effective. Some of them show that it's not just cost effective, but cost saving. Um, this is a, so, so one of the problems with the literature is uh, certainly from older studies is that they had very small numbers of patients. Uh, the, the thing about it is that uh, studies of bariatric surgery, even trials of bariatric surgery, tend to have small numbers. If, for example, I'm going to come to an Australian study in a minute which had 60 uh, participants in it. Now, in any other aspect of medicine, say, for example, statin trials or blood pressure trials or uh, glycemic control trials, you'd have thousands of patients in a control arm and thousands of patients in an intervention arm. With bariatric uh, surgical interventions, you need, you need a small fraction of that because the effect size is so huge because the benefits are so pronounced in these patients. So one of the issues with that then is that when you're bolting on uh, health economic analyses afterwards, you've got relatively small numbers of patients. For example, this study, this um, uh, Dutch study uh, from the 1990s, uh, exam you know, followed 21 people up. And when you're modeling what happens over an, entire life, uh, over, over, over an entire lifetime in 21 people who've had surgery versus 21 people who haven't, there's, there's some re it's relatively crude and imprecise. So that's just a challenge that I think people face when they're doing these health economic analyses. There are, so, as, uh, this is another study from Europe, um, uh, from Acroid et al, which compared uh, the, uh, the, the impact of obesity surgery in patients who specifically have type 2 diabetes in, in England, in Germany, and in France. And when they followed up these patients and, and looked at cost effectiveness, they found that it was actually cost saving in, in Germany and France, certainly for these patients that have bariatric surgery. So the cost of their care, including the cost of the surgery, was lower after they had, after they had bariatric surgery compared to control populations who didn't have bariatric surgery. Now, one of the issues with those studies is that they're com not necessarily comparing like with like, so they're kind of case control studies uh, where you're trying to match people as well as possible, uh, but they're not necessarily um, difference between the patients who've had the intervention, between the patients who've had bariatric surgery and the patients who've had, uh, who've not had bariatric surgery, who've had alternative treatments, you know that the only difference is that they were randomized to that group. So they're, otherwise you can assume that they're the same in terms of, uh, say, socioeconomic background, comorbidities, diabetes, etc. Um, this is a paper by Chang et al. For, uh, published in 2011. It was a very comprehensive review of about 280,000 patients, so it was a meta-analysis. And uh, they used a device called a Markov stimulation model, or simu sorry, Markov simulation model. See, there you go, a, a little knowledge. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, basically, it's, it's, it's hard to project there, but what they do is they, they, they take a cohort of patients and they map out uh, what happens in people with, in this particular paper, it's uh, obesity-related disorders uh, or complications of severe obesity versus those without complications. And specifically, we're talking about diabetes and sleep apnea syndrome. They'd be the major complications that we consider clinically and from a health economics point of view as well when, when you're looking at these patients. And then you divide those groups with complicated obesity versus non-complicated into people who've had surgery or no surgery. And then you move down the sort of model and you say, well, some of those will survive and some of them won't survive. And of the survivors, some of them will have complications that will improve and others will have complications that don't improve. And that will also happen in people who haven't had surgery. So there are all these scenarios. And then what you do is you, you, you sort of 
assign a probability to somebody having, say, resolution of their diabetes or not, or, or dying during the operation, or, uh, or, or, or a similar thing happening in terms of resolution of diabetes if they don't have the operation and they go on a different medication. So you take account of all of these different scenarios, and then you do what's called a sensitivity analysis in terms of saying, well, what if 1% of the people uh, who have this operation died as opposed to 0.25%? And what if only half of the people we thought would have resolution of their diabetes had resolution of their diabetes? You know, and, and you do all those things. And across every study, to cut a long story short, and given that I've less than five minutes to finish the, 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 the talk, um, uh, you know, it's consistent. They're always cost-effective. Cost and by that I mean the uh, quality-adjusted life year is, is less than around about uh, 40,000 US dollars, 25,000 euro thereabouts. Um, so, so, so it's well below the threshold for what we consider would consider a good investment. So with this particular study, uh, what was interesting about it was they found that in people with complications, there was a greater, uh, the, the, the cost was lower, uh, so the cost benefit was better. And so, uh, and they also found that it wasn't just in people who were complicated, who had, who had obesity-related disorders, uh, that they, that they, they had greater bang for their buck, but also people with worse, uh, with more severe obesity. So you can see there's actually a bit of a typo in the in the bottom of this um, slide, and I apologise for that. But in people with a body mass index over 50 who have complicated obesity with diabetes or sleep apnea, it's actually cost saving from this analysis uh, to to do this procedure to, 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 for them to have bariatric surgery. Okay, this is, a, a, again, a, an Australian study from Keating et al., uh, published in Diabetes Care in 2009, looking at, uh, you, you know, the cost effectiveness in patients with type 2 diabetes who were in a randomized control trial that was run by Dixon et al., so a pretty high-profile um, study uh, with 60 patients in, in, in it, uh, looking at um, gastric banding as a, as, a, as a therapeutic option for people with type 2 diabetes. And again, here's a, a, another Markov simulation model. Um, and what they showed, if I can read it, uh, I can't. What they showed, I'll, I'll tell you what they showed. They, they looked at lifetime costs over, uh, over the lifetime of these patients after bariatric surgery compared to not having it. And they found that it was cost saving, but only just. So the costs were $101,000 on average in adults with diabetes who had banding, and they were $99,000 on average in, in, in adults who did not have banding for their, for, their, for their obesity and diabetes. But still, it's overall cost saving, okay? And also, it prolonged life, and there was an increase of, I think, 1.6 quality-adjusted life years. Um, this is a paper, a similar paper again, and in the interest of time, I'll move on. It's similar, similar findings, to be honest with you, so, um, except from a much larger American cohort, a meta-analysis from the CDC, so, so more robust, but, but similar, similar findings. And it, it, what I was going to explore here was just the different considerations that health economic, uh, economists have to take into account, the different kind of, uh, um, yeah, there's parameter values there. And that. So, so, so again, it's about sensitivity analysis there. And, and what if people needed more, more medications than we thought? And the big concern, the big, the big area of uncertainty, as I understand it from the literature, is that it's, 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 we're not sure about how long diabetes goes away for after surgery. And so. Uh, that's where the big uncertainty comes in in terms of how, how much, uh, how, how cost effective it is. So if diabetes goes away for 10 years, that, that makes it much more cost effective. And uh, if, if, if it goes away for less than that, if it's less good than we expected. Uh, and of course, many of these studies have not followed up patients for, 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 for a long period of time in a randomized control trial yet. So those data are coming. That limitation was addressed in um, a big meta-analysis by PICO. Uh, from the, from the uh, this was a health technology uh, assessment uh, from the National Institute for Health Research in the UK, so very robust. And what this did then was it informed something that was easier for me to read, frankly. Um, this was a study from the Office for Health Economics called Shedding the Pounds. And what they did was they examined the impact hypothetically of providing bariatric surgery to um, appropriate patients based on nice guidelines. So, you know, BMI over 35 with complications or over 40 otherwise in England. And what this study showed in 2010 was that, for a start, I think it's important to note that we have similar obesity and overweight prevalence to, to the United Kingdom, so I think we're equi equivalent in many ways. And what they showed, it took the long story short, is that over a three-year period, if they provided this surgery to 25% of people who were eligible for it, they would save 1.3 billion pounds, that's 1.54, um, I think, uh, uh, billion euro, 
uh, if they were to provide this intervention uh, to a quarter of the people who need it. Now, clearly, you know, it's dangerous to just draw, you know, divide by 10 and bring over to Ireland, but it suggests that we stand to save tens of millions of euro if we invested in appropriate bariatric surgical services uh, for patients in Ireland. So I went going back to the Kit Kat just to finish. As you finish, have I uh, one minute? Yeah, the, the uh, I, I bought the Kit Kat. That's the thing, <laughs> you know. And uh, I I, uh, I was in the car and I was munching away and I was I was reflecting. Gosh, you know, it, it's it's of course it was free will. I went in there and I bought the thing and that's it. But I can't help but thinking that the price influenced the decision. And uh, you know, when I sit down with patients in my bariatric clinic who are very severely obese, they're guilty, or I'm guilty, of the same sin as they are. You know, there's no doubt that any of these patients who are sitting in our, in our clinic, they've all eaten far too much. They've all led very unhealthy lifestyles. But some people find it harder to avoid that than others. And we can, we can blame them and say it's their fault, and we can, uh, you know, talk about a biblical ideology for severe obesity. Is it gluttony? Is it sloth? You know, I think we've moved on from that over the last 20 years. I'd hope so. Um, but uh, imagine there was a patient standing here now, uh, you know, one of our patients standing here in front of you, and we had to tell them, look, we know that there's a, an effective diabetes curing, if you like it, well, that's too strong, but a diabetes helping, uh, life-saving, cost-effective intervention that we can provide to you if we want to, but we can't afford to. Uh, imagine that patient, how, how they feel. And now imagine that that patient uh, was thin. Would we, would we treat them the same way? So I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Finucane. So we're going to have two shorter talks. And the first is by Dr. John Cullinan, who's a lecturer in the discipline of economics. And he's going to talk about the impact of obesity on self-reported health. Thanks very much, Adele, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is a presentation on some very early stage research uh, on the impact of obesity on self-aided health, and it's joined with Paddy Gillespie, who's a colleague at the Health Economics and Policy Analysis Group in the Discipline of uh, Economics at NUI Galway. And in terms of, I suppose, my take-home message or my key finding from the presentation today, it's that obesity has a negative impact on self-aided health even after we control for a range of different individual socioeconomic health and lifestyle related variables. And what I'm going to ar argue today is that the, um, the impact of the study is even stronger than that. We're going to argue that there is actually a causal effect of obesity on self-rated health. Many previous studies have found some associations or no association at all, but using the statistical techniques um, that I'll discuss subsequently, we're going to argue that this is actually a causal effect. And for reasons that John Crawley discussed earlier, this is important that, um, at least for economists anyway, that we, that we um, can identify causal effects as opposed to statistical associations. Okay, so to uh, introduce, um, I suppose it's obvious enough that there's extensive evidence that obesity has a negative impact on a range of uh, different objective health outcome measures such as heart attack, uh, stroke, diabetes, cancer, etc. Um, where there's limited or quite mixed evidence uh, in the relation or, uh, on the impact of obesity is in relation to the impact on self-rated health, which is a broad and subjective summary measure uh, of different domains of health. So a number of previous studies that have looked at this have found um, some associations between the two variables, but they have failed to address what I would consider potential endogeneity concerns. The evidence is also mixed in terms of whether or not obesity impacts on self-rated health. So some studies, and most of them have found that there is an effect, but a number of studies have found uh, no effect at all. Okay, so why is self-rated health uh, important and an important variable to consider? Well, I suppose it's becoming an increasingly commonly used health measure, uh, which is generally accepted to be associated with a wide range of outcomes from well-being to health service utilization to mortality. A number of studies have found that self-rated health is a very, very good predictor of all of these uh, health outcomes. It's also increasingly been used as a screening tool for uh, general health assessment. And I suppose just to reflect its sort of ubiquity or its uh, increasing, um, increasingly common use, uh, a question in relation to self-rated health was included in the most recent census of population in Ireland. My understanding is that that question is going to be retained in future census 
And the idea basically is to provide a means of tracking population level health uh, over time. So despite this, and despite the sort of uh, increasingly common use of this particular measure, uh, it is, however, quite controversial in some, in some circles. The nature of our, I suppose, using a subjective measure of health is by itself somewhat controversial, but there are also some issues in relation to how reliable, how reliable uh, self-rated health may be um, in terms of uh, um, disadvantaged, more disadvantaged groups. So it is very, very commonly used. There are some concerns. Um, despite these concerns, a number of studies have looked to model and identify the determinants of self-rated health. Um, generally, these sorts of studies have tended to focus on the statistical associations between self-rated health and a number of different, um, uh, different variables. But in relation to the impact of obesity on self-rated health, as I mentioned, the evidence is quite mixed. There are some, I suppose, uncertainties in relation to the methodologies that have been employed. And I suppose that, therefore, the, the objective of this piece of research is to better understand the impact of obesity on self-rated health. So what does self-rated health look like as a variable? Well, in the, uh, in the data set that we analyze and the, uh, the survey questionnaire that, that we look at, survey respondents were asked, in general, how would you say your current health is? And they're given a set of options on a Likert scale, poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent. And different measures of self-rated health across different studies have used different classifications here, but they generally look something like this. And I suppose our objective really is to figure out is whether an obese person is more likely to rank themselves worse along a scale like this. Given that sort of question, um, the structure of that sort of question, it allows for, I suppose, a, a, a number of different measures for empirical analysis. So at a very simple level, we can imagine that self-rated health question providing a sort of a, a variable uh, one, two, three, four, five, and we can model that in a very simple ordinary least squares type um, environment, or we can consider, well, obviously, this is an ordered variable, and we need to take into account that five is greater than four is greater than three, and so on and so forth. In our modeling, and again, the results are, are relatively preliminary that I'm going to present, we also, um, I suppose, uh, restructure the self-rated health variable into two binary variables, which um, allow for uh, a different type of analysis. We can create variables that relate to whether or not a person re reports reduced self-rated general health. So the idea here is that you might construct a binary variable where the base category is excellent health and a person with the variable will take a value of zero uh, for that individual who reports their health as excellent. And then anything less than excellent could be considered reduced self-rated general health. All of the good, poor, etc., would take a value of one. Or alternatively, we might construct a variable which looks something like bad self-rated health. So anybody reporting excellent, very good, or good self-rated health, uh, that variable would take a value of zero. Um, alternatively, those reporting fair or poor health, uh, the variable would take a value of one. So we have considered all of those different measures in the analysis that I'm uh, going to talk about in a moment. And the data that we've used to undertake that analysis is the growing up in Ireland survey, which Brendan Walsh uh, mentioned uh, a few moments ago. Uh, it's, a very, it's a really excellent data set. Um, it's a national survey of over 8,500 nine-year-old children and their parents. And I suppose crucially for this sort of analysis and the, the different analyses that are being conducted at the moment in relation to obesity and childhood obesity in Ireland, it contains independently and objectively reported weight and height measures. So it's not self-reported, um, the weight and height measures or the BMI um, measures are not self-reported. And again, going back to John's talk earlier uh, this morning, that's very, very important for um, conducting robust research. The fact that we have these objectively recorded measures allows us to calculate pretty accurate BMI measures and then using WHO classifications break um, the BMI scale into different BMI categories. So we can classify individuals, uh, parents and children as obese, overweight, healthy and un underweight obviously acknowledging the difficulties and the, the, uh, the problems associated with using BMI in order to, to classify obesity. Uh, for the analysis that I'm going to talk about today, we've really only been uh, running these models in the last week or so, so um, I've needed to sort of uh, um, separate out the data set into, into different groups. I'm just going to talk about non-underweight mothers uh, in today's presentation, but we're hoping to extend the analysis to include fathers uh, as well. 
Okay, so here are some cross tabulations which will give us a little bit of a, a sense of what the relationship is between, um, I suppose, BMI category and self-rated health. And if you are to zone in on the, uh, the obese road, um, second from bottom, we've got 1,346 uh, obese mothers within uh, the sample that we're, uh, that we're, we're considering. 1.8% uh, of them rate their health as poor, 9.8% as fair, 26.9% as good, 39.3% is very good and 22.2% is excellent. So, I mean, I suppose when I calculated this cross-tabulation, given what we know about the impact of obesity on um, objective measures of health, I was a little bit surprised to see that one in five obese mothers in our sample um, rate their health as excellent. However, that is considerably less than the proportions in other weight categories who rate their health as excellent. And I suppose the other difference amongst obese mothers compared to the other categories is that significantly more of them rate their health as poor uh, or fair compared to, to, to those categories. So that's a, a sort of an indication of the general pattern or the general relationship between BMI category of my sample and how they rate or report uh, their health. Obviously, they're just uh, cross tabulations. What we're interested here in doing is actually modeling the impact of obesity on self-rated health. And again, the results are quite preliminary. The models considered um, are, um, are sort of early stage. And what we've done at a sort of very simple level is we've, we've estimated simple regression models of uh, self-rated health where we regress using ordinary least squares or an ordered logit model. The relationship between your reported health and say, for example, an obese dummy variable. So uh, a variable which takes a value of one if you're obese, zero if you're not, and we can try and just tease out the relationship between uh, self-rated health measured on a one to five scale and whether or not you're obese. But obviously we're interested in controlling for other factors that may determine your self-rated health. So we also estimate these sorts of models where we include a range of different control variables, which I'll discuss in a moment. The other types of models that we look at are binary logit models where we just regress to be something very, very similar, but we consider whether or not an individual has reduced self-rated health or bad self-rated health, and we regress those variables again on obese, an obese variable with and without controls. So here's a, a sort of a summary view of these very, very preliminary results. Um, in a simple OLS model of self-rated health regressed on obese, what we find is and all of these um, parameter estimates and, and odds ratios that I'm going to talk about are highly statistically significant. What we find is that if you are obese, your self-rated health is lower by minus 0 0.4, okay? The mean in the sample is, overall sample is about 4, so we find, I suppose, a practically significant or an economically significant uh, effect of being obese or an association of being obese on how you rate your health. Obviously, there are lots of other factors that are important in determining your self-rated health. There's a list of control variables on the slide that we include, like age, age squared, uh, whether you're Irish or not, whether or not you have a chronic illness, which may or may not be caused or determined by the fact that you're obese, and so on and so forth. And we include all of these control variables, and when we do, what we find is our parameter estimate or the effect of being obese on self-rated health is dampened a little bit, okay? It's a little bit smaller, but it still suggests that your self-rated health is lower if you're obese, even, even when we control for all of these other factors. Now, this is just the pure effect, if you like, of being obese on self-rated health. There may be other indirect effects because obesity may be causing or determining some of those chronic conditions, which we're, in a sense, sort of uh, partialing out when we include it as a control variable, and we have a bit more work to do there. Um, but nonetheless, what it's suggesting is that there's some, uh, there's some strong association here. We also do some slightly fancier econometrics just to account for the nature of the dependent variable and um, run ordered logit models. And these odds ratios for the ordered logit models are basically saying, because they're less than one, they're basically saying, if you are obese, you are less likely to rank yourself high up the scale of self-rated health. In terms of reduced self-rated health, uh, bad self-rated health, the odds ratios are greater than one in this case. And what we find is you're significantly more likely to rate your health as um, reduced from excellent or bad uh, if you're obese. Now, they're relatively straightforward, simple models. What they don't account for, uh, and which is something that John was discussing earlier on, is the possibility that our obese variable in the models is endogenous, either as a result of something called reverse causality, which I'll ignore, 
or omitted variable bias, which I won't ignore, which is, is, is quite possible. So the idea here is that there may be some other variable that we haven't controlled for which may be determining simultaneously whether or not you're obese and whether or not you report lower self-rated health. In that situation, what's happening is our obese variable and the parameter estimates that I've just put up in the slide, that these may be underestimating or overestimating the impact of, um, of obesity on self-rated health. So what we want to do, and in this regard we draw, on, draw inspiration, I suppose, from John's uh, earlier work on using the BMI of a biological relative as, a, as, a, as an instrument for whether or not you're obese, is we run a, a range of instrumental variables models to basically account for or reduce the effect of any omitted variable biases in our models. Now, again, they're sort of preliminary models that we've done. Our initial findings are suggesting that endogeneity is not a really serious concern for us, but what it does mean is, and what it does allow us to do, is to estimate what we consider very, very important causal effects of obesity on self-rated health. And this would be the main contribution of this piece of work to the, to the literature. Anything that's been done before, we think, will not have been able to adequately identify these causal effects, and we are able to do it. So just a few final comments. Obviously, the, the sort of the take home here, the, the, the big message here is that obesity has a negative impact on self-rated health. And you're probably all thinking, wow, tell me something I don't know. Okay, and that's obviously um, something that we would have expected coming into it. Um, but what we have here now is very strong evidence, I think, that this is actually a causal effect. It's not a statistical association. It's not just a correlation that's been driven by other variables that we're not taking into account. We think we've got good, strong evidence that we've estimated this causal effect. What it basically means in a nutshell is that if we reduce the prevalence of obesity in Ireland, we will improve the overall population health uh, as rated by its population. So we will see, and once we finalize the parameter coefficients, we will be able to calculate what will be the improvement in the overall self-rated health of the population for a given level of reduction in the prevalence of obesity. So the magnitude of this effect and the parameter coefficients which I've just dug up, they're important to isolate and to uh, calculate precisely because what it means is we can calculate these, uh, these returns from obesity uh, investments. We have a number of other ideas that we want to do along these lines. We want to look a little bit more closely at the BMI distribution, move away maybe from the sort of the cruder just divisions along the BMI distribution and maybe look and see if there are differences, you know, further to the right tail of the BMI distribution. And we also want to in introduce interactions into our models. We want to see whether or not this relationship between self-rated health and, and obesity, does it differ for males and females? Does it differ for people of different age groups, for people of different socioeconomic groups, and so on and so forth. So introducing fathers into the model uh, and into the data will be something that we'll be doing very soon. We also need to refine a little bit our instrumental variables models, so we're, we're happy with our final uh, parameter estimates. But once we do that, what we're going to be able to say, hopefully, is reducing obesity by X is going to lead to greater our improved self-reported population health of Y, and I think that could be a very, positive, uh, a, very, a very positive statistic to be able to use in terms of convincing policymakers that we need to do more about the obesity problem. So that's it. Thanks all. Thanks, John. So we have our last speaker, who is Dr. Paddy Gillespie, who is a lecturer in the discipline of economics, and he is going to talk about the impact of obesity on a maternity care and cost. And uh, after this talk, we'll, I'm going to invite the speakers up uh, for some questions. Okay, so thank you, Adele, and good afternoon, all. Um, so this work that I'm going to talk about today is joint work with colleagues here at NUI Galway, with John Cullen and, and Kieran O'Neill from the Health Economics and Policy Analysis Group, and also with uh, Professor Fidel Dunn, who is based at the School of Medicine here at uh, NUI Galway. And just to say, Brendan's asked me to say as well, um, our website is there on my first slide, um, which can bring you through a lot of the work we're doing here in the area of health economics at NUI Galway. Uh, we also have an updated news and events pages, and we're going to upload all the presentations, including my own. Uh, up there afterwards, um, so you can come back and visit those, and hopefully we'll get some slides, and we'll have the, um, the video clips as well, so you can get access to those. Okay, so in terms of the work today, my focus will be in, in trying to explore the impacts of obesity 
uh, on maternity care and costs in Ireland. And go back to some of the previous conversations and that important distinction that we make in health economics and in economics generally about causality versus correlation. Um, I'm very much going to go back into the, the more limited field, I suppose, or the lim limited area of looking at a correlation, and that I'm trying to assess um, what is the impact of obesity and pregnancy um, on maternity care and costs in the Irish setting. Okay, and not to spoil what will follow, but just to give you, I suppose, our take-home messages at the start before we get into the meat of the presentation, what we find is that, in fact, that obesity and pregnancy is associated with significantly higher levels of cesarean section, with significantly higher levels of neonatal intensive care unit admission of the infant of a woman with, uh, with obesity and pregnancy. And then when we cost up or value those two resource activities, obesity, obesity also has a, a significant effect in terms of maternity care costs. And really what we tried to do with this, this piece of work is try to identify, if you like, the excess burden that's been placed upon the maternity care services and how much of that can be attributable to overweight and obesity. Okay, and, and just to, to say that this work forms part of a wider uh, research program, uh, that is the Atlantic Diabetes in Pregnancy program, um, which has been run out of the, the School of Medicine here at NUI Galway. Um, and the initial, I suppose, objective of our work in this area was to examine the impact of gestational diabetes, which is a form of diabetes that occurs during pregnancy. And we wanted to get a sense of how that impacts upon maternity care, which in this case I'm talking about the type of delivery or the mode of delivery at secondary, whether the infant was uh, required neonatal intensive care uh, post um, birth, um, and also the cost associated. But um, today, and given the context of, of the work, we're going to kind of repackage the results of this paper, um, essentially presenting the same findings, but um, placing the spotlight firmly on the impact of obesity. And that's what I, I will do today. Um, and in terms of so just broader information on the Atlantic Dip net Network, it's um, a network, and here is, hopefully you can see in the slide, this, the, the, the red dots are the individuals included in our sample. Um, and the, the, the larger boxes are the five regional hospitals that form part of this network. Um, and we have data for individuals at all these hospitals um, on a range of clinical characteristics, pregnancy outcomes for the mother and the child, their healthcare utilization, which then we use to cost up for our analysis. Um, but an important caveat, I suppose, um, that uh, we need to, to, to mention at this point is that we only have data for those women who agreed to participate in um, GDM screening. So uh, to identify or to, to diagnose gestational diabetes, you have to undertake a, what's called an oral, uh, an oral glucose tolerance test, an OGTT. Um, and those women that agreed to and, and attended and, and to undertook this test, we have their data, but this counted for just 58% of the overall um, population in, in this in this. Uh, in this region in the network. So that's a, an important issue to note uh, at the start. Okay, so for the purpose of, purposes of our analysis today then, so we have a sample of 4,372 women and just scanning their sample characteristics, I'll focus on the important character, char characteristic for today and that is the obesity uh, variable. So at this point you can see that in terms of all these women, 39% uh, fall into the normal weight category, and I'll go back to how I uh, determine these later on. 36% uh, were overweight and 25% were obese. And it's also important to note at this point that the actual measurement of the weight was undertaken at the ladies' um, booking visit, so their first visit to the hospital, which occurred at between 18 and 20 weeks of the pregnancy. So possibly a more accurate uh, title of our paper is the impact of obesity at 18 to 20 weeks into the pregnancy on maternity care and costs. But with that, I think it's some of our findings are so somewhat um, stark and, uh, and uh, interesting. Okay, so in terms of the approach we took, uh, we, we apply uh, this multivariate regression framework, which some of my colleagues have talked to already. And what we do is we identify three outcome variables. So we're interested in the impact of obesity on these three variables. So first of all, mode of delivery. So for all women, for all 4,000 women, we have, in, we have information on the type of delivery they had. So was it a normal delivery, an assisted uh, normal delivery, an elective cesarean section, 
um, or an emergency cesarean section. And essentially what we want to do in our analysis is to estimate the increased likelihood or whether there is an increased likelihood of having one of the more complicated um, deliveries if you're obese relative to if you fall into a normal weight. We do the same analysis for uh, whether the infant of the, uh, the, the newborn infant had to be admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. And then we cost up these two resource activities and our final outcome variable is the cost of care or what we title here, the maternity care costs. So in each case, in each of our three analysis, we want to estimate the association between obesity and the outcome of interest. So in terms of our, our framework then, so we have a range of independent variables that we're going to examine. Um, the primary focus today obviously is the impact of the BMI at, at the booking, the booking um, visit at the hospital. But we also include a range of other possible cost drivers or drivers of, of the other resource activities. So we have the age category, ethnicity, um, parity, uh, gestational diabetes, family history of diabetes, whether there's a, evidence of a previous miscarriage, and then importantly as well, the delivery week, the period, the, the point in time when the delivery occurred. So we include all these other variables in our analysis um, to try to tease out uh, the, the association between obesity um, itself and, and the outcomes of interest. Uh, but very much we, we place this in the, the caveat of the, these are in fact correlations and we don't uh, claim these to be ca causal effects. Um, and importantly there you can see we've classified obesity in this case using the standard definitions, the WHO definitions. And what we can tell unfortunately from our analysis is between that period, between zero and 18 to 20 weeks, how many women, pregnant women, move from a normal weight into an overweight category or an overweight category into an obese category. It's just not possible. So we, we, we don't, um, we, we essentially undertake the analysis assuming that the categorization is appropriate for 18 to 20 weeks. Um, okay, so with that, and these are the results we've found and uh, we have three analysis, we have three models. Um, the blue or gray model is that for mode of delivery. The, 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 the middle model is for neonatal admission and the last is for cost of care. So um, if we take first of all the mode of delivery analysis, what we're interested in here is the increased likelihood of having an assisted normal delivery an elective cesarean or an emergency cesarean relative to a normal delivery. And then secondly, does this likelihood increase when you are overweight or when you are obese? Um, so what we find, and these can be interpreted as odds ratios um, in the mode of delivery analysis. So women that are overweight are 1.79 times um, more likely to have an elective cesarean section than uh, a woman that's um, a normal weight. And women um, that are obese are 2.67 times more likely to have had an elective C-section uh, relative to women in the normal weight category. Uh, so we can see there that obesity and overweight matter for um, whether you have uh, an elective C-section or not. Um, so the other category there where we find uh, significant results is for emergency C-section. Thanks for that. Um, and again, we see that being overweight and obese um, has a significant impact on your likelihood of having an emergency C-section. So for overweight women, it's 1.53 times more likely, and for ob obese women, it's 2.56 more likely to have an emergency C-section if you're overweight relative to uh, being in a normal weight category. In terms of our second analysis, that is whether the likelihood of your infant being requiring care in the neonatal intensive care unit we also see that there's a significant effect for obesity. So um, if the woman is obese, the chances of her infant being uh, requiring neonatal uh, care in the intensive care unit is 1.4 times more likely than where she uh, normal weight on her booking visit. And finally, in our, uh, in our third model, we estimate the excess cost that we can, we can say that is associated with a woman, be, woman being obese at our booking visit. And we estimate here that the, the cost increase or the excess burden is there's, a, there's an increase on average of cost of 20% that we say that is associated with um, being obese relative to uh, normal. So a woman that's obese costs 20% uh, more than a woman who is categorized um, in a normal weight category um, at their booking visit. 
So just to conclude then, so we do find then that obesity in pregnancy is strongly associated uh, with significantly higher levels of cesarean section of neonatal intensive care unit admission and maternity care costs. Um, and I suppose that's the focus of our analysis today and some of the other results I've just listed there I won't go through in terms of the other important drivers of cost and drivers of uh, resource activity. But I suppose it follows and what we would conclude is that there is an excess burden in terms that is being placed upon the maternity care services. So there are potential economic as well as clinical benefits to the prevention and reduction in, in, and uh, elimination of obesity in pregnancy. So thank you very much. So I'd like to invite the speakers up for approximately 10 minutes of questions. So I'll open it to the floor. Uh, I think there's a roving mic. So if you want to just maybe introduce yourself when you ask the question and feel free to ask any hard questions. <laughs> Hello, thank you for a very interesting morning. Um, my name is Anya Eagleguyne. I'm with a Parent and Care NGO. And I have a question for uh, Dr. Cullinan. Um, uh, I'm aware that there's been some research on uh, carers and self-reported health, um, uh, that it's lower for carers than for the general population. So I was just wondering if um, you have done any work on that or if you are planning to look at specifically family carers. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for your question and um, yeah that's a really good question we we have thought about that in the current analysis as I said during the talk it's, it's quite preliminary our work but one of the variables one of the control variables that we include is whether or not uh, the mother's ch uh, the child has a chronic illness or condition so the assumption there would be that um, I suppose caring for a child with a chronic illness or condition may may lead to addis additional uh, stresses um, additional uh, or a reduction in the health status of the of the mother and therefore make the mother less likely to report good self-rated health so um, from that point of view we don't address specifically um, the issue you're talking about but we do try to control for it uh, in um, uh, in a certain sense um, I have a PhD student at the moment who's doing work on the economics of childhood uh, disability at the moment and I can talk to you maybe a little bit more about that because it's outside the interest of, of this talk but that's something that we look a little bit more specifically uh, at in, in her work. Hi, uh, I'm Adrian Lynham from the HSC. I just have a question from Michelle. Um, just wondering if there were any gender differences in the preferences that you found because we know that um, lifestyle interventions for men and women. Uh, the women tend to like the nutritional side of things and the men tend to like the physical activity side of things. And I'm just wondering, did any of that translate into the preferences that they went for? Were, were men, in other words, more likely to go for the drug end of things or both yeah. or neither? Thanks, great question. So I just outlined in, in the, in the um, presentation that we, are, we have yet to look at gender differences, but I guess um, from conducting all the focus groups and interviews and surveys myself, um, offhand, there was um, just, I guess, in people's preferences, word, I guess, without doing the analysis, there was um, difference in terms of preferences around, like what you said, um, surgery um, and um, diet and lifestyle modification, in that women seem to prefer um, the, the harder option, and men might have gone for the. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm only joking, Francis. No, uh, just, I guess, that's not um, analysed, is, is, is the correct answer to that just yet, but we will be doing it in, in future research. Hi, I'm Andy, um, pregnant life doctor. I have two questions. One for um, Paddy. Um, it, it just said there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago showing that um, one of the um, the highest preventable cause of stillbirth in um, women in the U.S. was obesity. Did you include? Did you look at stillbirth? So. Um, the, the short answer is no in terms of um, 
as part of the wider project, the Atlantic um, DIP program, there's, there's a range of different studies going on, and this particular analysis was focused purely on the resource use element and cost element. So we just essentially, to be blunt about it, we didn't ask what happened. We said, okay, you had this type of delivery, and the, admission, the, the child was admitted to the ward. The cost of those, and those are our items of interest, but yes, there's lots of other stuff that can be explored within that, and I know at the present time other colleagues within the network are exploring those types of questions, but I, I, we didn't do it in okay, that thanks. 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 Um, I have another question which basically reflects my own ignorance. It's for John. Um, if I heard him rightly, he, when he was mentioning all the things he controlled for, he said H squared. Oh. And I have no idea why you would do that. <laughs> so sure. maybe he could okay, explain. So one of the things we want to see or control for is the likelihood that people will, re will rate their health differently at different stages of the life cycle. So typically um, what happens in uh, or the, the relationship between child-credit health and age is that it's, it's, there's a nonlinear relationship between them. So given the fact that um, we find the coefficient on age is, um, is positive but the coefficient on age squared is negative, what it means is that as you... Uh, as you move from say 20 to 30 to 40, your self-rated health um, actually improves, but you reach, but it does so at a diminishing rate. So what it means is you'll reach a, you'll reach a point, the bad news for me, given my upcoming birthday, is that turning point is 39. Uh, and after 39, uh, we can expect to see self-rated health uh, start to decrease uh, and, do, and do so quite quickly. So it just reflects the nonlinear relationship between self-rated health and age. And for those of you, less than 39, okay, you've got a couple more years of looking forward to reporting good health. For those of you on the, the far side of that, I'm afraid it's all down. Okay, so any more questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm just a question for Paddy. Um, there's massive differences in C-section rates between different hospitals. So I think Mount Carmel is well up in the high 30s and Sligo is 18%. How do you control for that as your baseline for each hospital? So um, we, 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 we have, we call it fixed effects. So we've, uh, we just have an indicator for each hospital and we control for that. Um, you can go to, into it more, f uh, you can delve into that more fully, but even the sensitivi sensitivities of that issue um, and highlighting that Hospital A has this rate, as we've seen recently in the, the press release in the last few weeks about um, the different rates and, and, and practices in different hospitals. We just essentially didn't go into that <laughs> question. But um, in, in other analysis we've done on smaller samples, we've got more information and we're kind of teasing out some of the more, um, the other factors. So for example, in this, exam in this analysis, we have no information on things like private health insurance. Um, and other, uh, other analysis we're doing we do have that information and we, we see that it does have an effect, but we can't tease out who's driving the differing uh, patterns. Is it, the, is it the woman with private health insurance that's saying, I want a cesarean section? Is it the doctor saying that this is, a, that this is the, the option we want to take? We can't tell from our analysis. I know it's a very controversial issue, but we just can't tell. Well, hi, I'm Emily from UCD. I've got a question for Brendan. I wondered, did you notice anything about food insecurity distributed across um, social class in your cohort? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> well, the GUI was very good with a lot of variables. I don't think their diet variables are as intricate as maybe we would want. So we had a lot of um, data related to their diet, but it was maybe in the last month, last week, last day, so it didn't really go into that, no. Thank you, uh, Keena Foley Nolan from Safe Food. Uh, this is a question for whoever wishes. Uh, if you look at the current, um, I suppose, reported costs to society of problem alcohol uh, use in Ireland, it comes out at a gross figure, which is very impressive from, uh, I suppose, a lobbying perspective, and that's 3.7 billion. Whereas what has been looked at to date uh, is the healthcare uh, costs and also the um, uh, absence from work costs from the point of view of obesity. 
So, you know, there looks to be a great disparity, and I'm just wondering if you have any specific plans, anybody in, in the uh, team, to, I suppose, widen the scope uh, in terms of looking at other areas. You've mentioned psychological health uh, as being one. Thank you. I don't know I'm going to answer this one. So I would have worked with Andy um, along with a number of other colleagues looking at the economic costs of obesity across the, Var the island of Ireland. And we would have looked at, yes, what you mentioned, the direct costs and indirect costs. Um, I suppose from our perspective, sometimes it's difficult in terms of getting data. So that would be one limitation. Um, and, you know, I suppose I, I, I've moved on in terms of what I'm working on at the moment, but I think there is a lot of scope to investigate this further and I think there's a lot of scope as well in terms of you know now we know that like obesity is a problem among childhood so what are the projections going to be into the future and that could have enorm enormous implications so I would say yes I think it's research that needs to be done and um, if anybody wants to fund any of us <laughs> that would be fine too. Um, just a question for uh, Jeremy Coughlin from NUR Galway for Dr. Francis. Uh, just um, wondering about uh, peer effects between obese patients. Um, do you find that, uh, that, does that how, uh, how does that manifest itself or is there a role for peer group? Or, uh, and the second question is uh, basically uh, how did you get on with the health economist uh, as a medical and what advice would you give for other medics uh, wishing to engage with health economists? So I, I actually missed the second. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Okay, so the first question, it's interesting, the, um, the, the peer effect is now, um, so, so other, other um, areas of medicine, say for example cancer, are, are probably more favorably disposed and, and, and provide a better opportunity for peer support than, than, than obesity um, management services, severe obesity management services. I mean, there are, there are community-based interventions, things like Weight Watchers, LAC, which is a heavily peer-based. Um, but what we found anecdotally in, our, in the patients attending our clinic are there, there's a proportion of them who've spontaneously formed their own support group uh, on Facebook and that, and they report finding that very helpful indeed. Um, so, so I think there is a need for that, and it would be nice to quantify that and to develop it, because I think for some patients it would be very helpful. We haven't been able to do that yet. Um, we do have um, a group-based intervention uh, with Cree. That's a 10-week that's a, a structured lifestyle program. And the retention with that is, is incredible. About 90% of people complete the program, so that's very, uh, that compares very favorably to other structured programs. Um, so, and that there's a, certainly an element of peer support in that. Uh, so for some people, it works very well. It's something that they seek, and for others, it's not so important. For, for men, for younger patients, it's probably less important than it is for older patients or, or for women in general attending the clinic. But we haven't formally quantified that. Thank you, uh, Pat Costello. If I could put a, a, a comment and a question to Professor John Cawley. Um, I arrived late, perhaps I didn't um, hear, but did you make any reference to the TV viewing time of the American? Um, I heard the figures recently, the effect that the average American spends five hours looking at TV. The average um, English spends four hours. Now, um, I remember um, the Chancellor, the German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, um, this a while back. He and the Surgeon General in America were hoping to introduce a TV free day in America and in Germany. Helmut Schmidt was forced out of office. I wonder, um, um, Prof. Cawley, have the Americans considered a healthier um, way of TV viewing? So an interesting thing is that uh, among American children, TV viewing's actually gone down in the last few decades, but that's because it's substitution towards other screen time. So they're spending more time playing video games and computer games and less actually watching 
uh, TV. So actually, kids' exposure to advertising has somewhat gone down, advertising through television. Um, but obviously, it remains a concern because it's a source of you know, sedentary entertainment. But it's also kind of interesting to think about the fact that reading is about as equally sedentary as watching TV. And so we want to be, we want to avoid uh, focusing too much on any one single factor. Uh, it might be a little bit too simplistic. But, but so I think this is an example of how, uh, you know, the reality of what's contributing to obesity is actually quite complex. And conventional wisdom tends to be that, you know, kids are probably watching too much TV. But in this specific case, it's something that's gone down in recent years as kids have shifted towards other sort of substitute methods of entertainment. Thanks, Sean. So I'd like to just finish the session with a big round of applause for all our speakers. I think <laughs> In case Adele doesn't know where lunch is, uh, it's upstairs. Maybe it is. All right. Uh, so uh, you just, but you, uh, in a kind of strange way to get upstairs, you have to go out into the quadrangle, turn left, and the next left will take you upstairs. And as I say, it's uh, lunch. And the other thing, I've been very bad on, on housekeeping things. I was uh, supposed to tell you that the toilets uh, are across the quadrangle. Um, many of you probably know this by now. Um, I, I hope. <laughs> uh, ladies on the left and uh, men on the right. And I hope you noticed that uh, just in the last few minutes, uh, a man or a woman uh, ran by there. So uh, there are people out there enjoying the nice sunshine. So uh, maybe over the next hour, you get a chance to have a look around the quadrangle. And we'll be back here at 2 o'clock. Thanks very much. Thank you.